Hello, my name is Patrick Allen, and I am an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And the program uh, that I'm involved with is uh, located in uh, southwestern Ohio at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. The individual who is the head of the program there is Brian Powers. And uh, today uh, is November the 15th, 1922, and we have the privilege of interviewing a Vietnam veteran, Derwin Kim, at his home at 1744 Stony Brook Road right. in, in Warfordsburg, Pennsylvania, W-A-R-F-O-R-D-S-B-U-R-G, Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Kim, thank you for letting me do this interview and thank you for your service. Oh, you're welcome. And, uh, welcome. <clears throat> if, you, if you need a break, just, just let us know. Um, what, what's your full name, Derwin? Uh, Derwin Finn Cannon Kim. Finn Spe Cannon is uh, my mother's maiden name. And that's spelled how? F-I-N-C-A-N-N-O-N. -N -N Where and when were you born? Uh, I was born in uh, Newark, New Jersey, I think at a hospital called Beth Israel, which I think is still there, but I'm not sure. And when? Yeah, on June 27th, 1940. So you're, uh, you just had your 82nd birthday? Correct. I, the Back next in June. June. June will be 83. So uh, did the family live in Newark when you were born? Uh, for a short time, I, I, till I was two th or three, I think. And then they moved to the Washington area. Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C. area. What, was your, what were the names of your mom and dad? Uh, my dad was Joseph C. Kim, and my mother was uh, Rosalie Kim. And her maiden name was Finn Cannon? Correct. Do you know uh, or do you have any recollection of when your mom and dad got married? No, I, uh, I don't know exactly when they married. I've, I, got, I have pictures of uh, both of them in the early days, but no wedding photo that I know of. What did your dad do? What was his occupation? He, he was in photography. He, he was a retoucher, meaning uh, he took the negative for portraits and... Uh, and uh, Touched them up to make them look good? Make them look good, that's <laughs> right. How about your mom? Did, uh, uh, did, did she work outside the home before she, she and your dad married? Do you know? Uh, I, she, I think she had a job in uh, Newark or maybe New York uh, during the war for the uh, working for the Signal Corps, but I, I, I don't think she worked very long because she couldn't get daycare and there were three of us kids. So she uh, didn't work. I think she also uh, uh, was like a, a lady's companion. For a, for a time. Okay. Now uh, you said there were three of you. Uh, tell me the names and ages of your uh, siblings. Uh, I have an older brother, Boris, uh, and his age is. Um, he just turned eighty-four, and uh, I have a younger sister, Elizabeth, and I believe she is uh, eighty. 80. You got down here 80? Yes. Now, uh, Boris is B-O-R-I-S? Correct. Just like Boris Karloff. Uh, did he have a middle initial or? F. He, his, he, he had the same middle name. Uh, in those days, uh, apparently, uh, giving your sons uh, your mother, their mother's maiden name was popular. Good. And Liz, your sister Elizabeth, is she married? Yes, yeah, she's married to a, a fellow named. Uh, uh, his last name's McKay. McVoy. McVoy is his last name. McVoy. McVoy and Cullen. 
Colin McVoy. Colin McVoy. All right, where does Boris live? Uh, Boris lives in Pasadena, Maryland. But he has a he has he owns a piece of waterfront property. Used to have a, a sailboat, but now he's uh, but he still lives at the same place. What kind of work did he do? Uh, uh, he was a physicist, and he worked for the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in uh, Howard County, Maryland, and then retired from there. He's retired now, of course. About Elizabeth, did she work outside the home? I'm not sure. Uh, she she worked. She and her husband, I think, worked from in the home. She, but she she did have a job at uh, uh, Family Circle at at one time. And then, then they did these other things, which they did out of their home. I'm not exactly sure what that was all about. How about Boris? Does he have children? He has uh, two children. Uh, he has a son, uh, um, Carlton, and a daughter, um, Greta. And they have, uh, let's see, Carlton has two boys. Uh, one is um, Noah, and the other one is... Logan. Logan. And Greta has three children. She has uh, uh, two daughters. One is um, Veronica. And then she has a second, a younger one, Kimberly. And finally, she has a, a young son. Well, I think he's 19 or 20 now, uh, 21. Uh, his, his name is uh, uh, Zach. Zachary. Zachary. <clears throat> well, when uh, when your family moved to Washington, uh, how long did you live there? Well, we lived there f uh, the rest of my childhood, and uh, I went to school. Uh, we, we 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 lived in the Washington area, but we actually lived in Maryland, Prince George's County, Maryland. And so I went to school in Prince George's County, and uh, uh, we lived there. Uh, let's see, I lived there uh, in Maryland uh, up until we moved here to Pennsylvania back in 2015. So what, what uh, schools did you go to in uh, grade school and high school? I went to Suitland Elementary School, which no longer exists, and then I went to Suitland Junior Senior High School. And th that uh, at that time it was um, uh, it went from the seventh grade to the twelfth grade. I graduated in 1958. What's, how do you spell the name of that school? Oh, Suitland, S-U-I-T-L-A-N-D. That was a grade school and high school. Well, no, the, the, there was a Suitland Elementary School, which was a regular an elementary school. It was a separate building, uh, you know, it was a mile or so away from the high school. And then the high school, uh, uh, like I say, uh, went from the 7th to the 12th. Then as time went on, they, they cut out the lower, uh, the 7, 8, and 9, and, and they built another uh, junior high school, they called it th at that time. Jerry, you haven't mentioned that your father is Korean. Oh. Well, um, while you were in school, uh, did you play any athletics? Uh, I, I played uh, football one year. And I, play, I played uh, basketball for a couple of years, and I was on the track team. What position did you play in basketball? You were kind of I was, tall. I, were you center? No, we had, a, we had a guy that was a lot taller than I was, three or four inches taller than me. So I, was, I guess I was a forward. How about football would you play? I was an end in, four, uh, in football. And... Uh, what else did you play? You ran track? I ran track. I ran uh, the hurdles and uh, 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 do any of the relay races? Yes, ran some, some relay races, anchored, uh, not anchored, but uh, uh, the mile relay and uh, uh, may have ran some of the shorter relays. How about hurdles? Did you run the highs or the lows? Uh, in or high both. school, I, 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 basically we only had the low hurdles. Okay. So I ran the low hurdles in high school. And you graduated when? In 50? I, I graduated from uh, uh, Suitland in uh, 1958, June of 1958. 
while you were going to school, did, did you work at all? Yeah, yes, I had a, I had a job. Uh, the uh, Washington Post, which is in Washington, D.C., uh, they had uh, uh, on, the, on Sunday, the Sunday newspaper had a comic section, and I was actually uh, called an inserter. So the, the, the comic section and the regular newspaper were separate, and we inserted the, the, uh, the comic section and the ad advertisements into the uh, main newspaper on Saturday night. It was an all night, started in the afternoon and went into the, into the early morning hours, two, three o'clock in the morning. And then when we finished, went home. <laughs> How long did you do that? How many years did you do that? I did that for, uh, I started when I was 16, which I think it would be 10th grade. And then um, I did it till I was in high, till I was a senior, I think. I can't remember exactly, but. Remember I, what you got paid? Yeah, it was a dollar an hour. And then uh, uh, it went up to a dollar 15 an hour, which was the minimum wage. And uh I think that was that was the size I got, dollar fifteen an hour. Well, that was big money back big in those money. days for it us was, kids. Yeah, it was. It it was money. That was well, that was the main thing. <laughs> what did you do with your money? Did you help the family, or did you save it for and get things for yourself? I I, I saved it almost all of it. I saved all of it, and then when I was a, uh, when I saved up enough, I think about three hundred dollars, I uh, I actually bought a car, an old uh, used nineteen fifty Chevrolet. That was titled in your name? Uh, yes, I believe it was. I think it was titled. I, I was old enough by then. What, what color was it? It was black. And did any other kids in, the, in high school have a car? Uh, there weren't, not like today, the, uh, but there were, uh, most of the kids had cars. They were old cars. Uh, used cars, and uh, but I do remember there was one kid that uh, his parents apparently uh, had the money, and he had a 1956 Chevrolet, which everybody thought was that was the coolest car. Around. It, was, it was top dog in the class. <laughs> it wasn't was it? definitely. Uh, your dad. Your dad was in photography. Uh, his name was Joseph. Did he have a nickname? Did people call Not him Joe or Joseph? Not that I know, but but uh, he, he was Korean, so his actually uh, the uh, uh, his middle initial was C, which stands for Chung Young. So he kept that part of his uh, his uh, Korean name. Do you know Do you know how he and and your mom Rosalie met? I think no, I'm not I'm not sure, but I think uh, they met. In, uh, in New York City in a park, just met like, I, I think that's how it is. I, I don't remember, I, I, I never heard any of the details. Uh, after you graduated high school, uh, what did you do? Uh, I went to college, I uh, in, uh, went to uh, Johns Hopkins uh, in uh, Baltimore. <laughs> Did you graduate from John Hopkins? Yes, I graduated from Hopkins in uh, 62, four years later. What, what was your major? Would you... I was an electrical engineer. Did you work while you were in college? Uh, yes, I had job, uh, just, uh, yeah, I had some, actually some pretty good jobs. Pretty good, interesting, let me put it that way. I worked in the cafeteria serving food and the, uh, uh, I remember one of the jobs I had, because I had a car at that time, this was I think uh, later in my junior or senior year, the, uh, the school put out, the student body put out a, a newspaper and uh, there were a couple of uh, uh, girls schools, Goucher and I think uh, uh, the, the nursing school for Johns Hopkins Hospital, there were a couple of places like that were all girls. And so we would, uh, 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 I, I was, uh, I had the job of picking up newspapers and, and then delivering them in bulk to, to these schools so the girls could read about us, Hopkins guys. 
So how many uh, days a week did you do that? It was well, it was once a week, or it may have been once every two weeks. I don't I don't remember. It's just I would get a call get, to deliver them, and I I would go, and I I can't even remember what they paid me. They must, but I got paid for it. Well, now your wife is here listening to this, and I'm going to ask you: in high school or college, did you have any girlfriends? Uh. Well, in 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 high school, yes, I had a, I, I I had a, uh, my high school sweetheart. I actually married her. Uh, her name was Linda, and I have a daughter. My oldest girl is Claudia. That's her, that's her mother. And uh, when did uh, you and Linda get married? We got married in 1963, uh, and. Um, then uh, I went off to, uh, I had taken ROTC at Hopkins, so I got my commission and uh, I, I basically had a year off before I had to report for active duty. So I worked for Pepco, the, the local power company in Washington, and, we, and Linda and I got married at the, uh, near the end and then she went with me to my, uh, I was stationed at uh, Fort Bliss, Texas in El Paso. And so we went there. So then, since you were in ROTC, you, your commission was a, was second lieutenant. Right, I was a reserve second lieutenant. So why why did you not have to go into service right away? You had a year off. Well, I, it was the, uh, they they said you you have up to a year to to uh, start your active duty. So I thought I I could work for I I got this job with. Uh, Pepco and I, I could work for a, a year and, and save some money so I said okay I'll take it and so they set the date which was in June of 1963 and then when that came I got in the car off I went. So well, what's Pepco is that? Uh... That's, uh, that's Potomac Electric Power Company so they they just provide the electricity for Washington DC and Part of Northern Virginia and uh, and the surrounding Maryland area, uh, Montgomery and Prince George's County. Were you able to use your engineering uh, education in that job? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it was I, I, I'll the not as much as I thought I would because uh, the uh, at that time they were teaching uh, uh, more. Uh, electronics engineering and so uh, uh, instead of power and uh, but I, I managed you know it's just find out what's going on and then learn how to do it. So you'd been making a dollar fifteen what, what are you making for Pepco? Was it uh, hourly or salary? It was it I remember it was um, I started out at hundred and thirty dollars a week wherever that comes out to. I, 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 that was good money. It was it was it was fine. It was uh, it was it was fine. I, I no complaints. I, I was li still living at home, so uh, I could save most of it, and I saved a lot of it. So when you and Linda got married, where did you live with your folks? No, we. I, I went into the service. Uh, I, I went to El Paso, and uh, we 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 got married just before that, and. Uh, uh, it was uh, so we lived on base in in uh, uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. Well, how'd you get the invitation to uh, go into the service then after after this year? A letter, telegram, phone call. How did you get? The, you, you, uh, I'm not sure I understand what you, you, you mean. To, you had a year off, and then you got a report. Yeah, I had. How, how did you get the notice to report? Well, it was it was just I got orders. You know, they came in the mail. Uh, and it said report on such such a date, and uh, so uh, and I uh, so I just drove. I drove to the from Washington to El Paso. From the time you got your notice to report to the time you got in the car to leave, how much time did you have? Well, I I, I pretty much knew right away after I got my commission. Then, uh, which was in uh, uh, June of nineteen uh, sixty. Uh, three, 1962, 
in June of 1962, I, I got my commission and then uh, uh, the orders, uh, I told them when I would like to, you know, put it off as long as possible. And so they gave me a date, which was June 20, 1963. June 23? That's right. June 23 was my reporting date. So did you get a chance to say goodbye to mom and dad before you started out for Texas? Oh yeah, I I said goodbye to everybody and uh, what what your folks car. think? What your folks think about that? I you know I, I think they just accepted it. There was no big uh, ceremony or no no tears, no nothing. It's just goodbye. I'll see you. I'll I'll be back. And the branch of service you were in was the army. Was the army correct? No. Uh, did you have a choice to what service you were going to go into when you graduated from uh, John Hopkins? Well, it it they it was an Army ROTC program, so it, was, it had to be the Army. But you had a choice, and uh, uh, I, you, I I recall you could pick like infantry or armor or quartermaster. There were different options. I, I can't actually remember. I think I I put artillery as second or third, and that's what I got. So you didn't get, what was your first choice? You know, I don't remember. It, <laughs> it could have been infantry. It could have been infantry, but uh, I got ended up in the artillery. And I wasn't actually in the field artillery, you know, where, the, where, where I ended up when I was in Vietnam. But it was in air defense artillery. So this is with, um, uh, uh, back then, they, they had uh, Nike Hawk and Nike Ajax missiles, which were supposed to be our the continental United States air defense against uh, some kind of a Russian attack with with airplanes. So ground to air missiles? Correct, yeah, ground to air missiles, which I, I'm pretty sure were never fired in anger. Well, so you drove to Fort Bliss, and when you got to Fort Bliss, did you live on base? Yes, I lived, I got base housing, which was very nice. It was uh, like a three bedroom, um, uh, one story, uh, no basement, you know, it's uh, uh, just, just right like, there out there on the sand. Just like a plant house. Yes. And uh, now did you and Linda have a child by that time? Uh, uh, the, my, uh, Claudia was born in January of the following year. Okay. How long were you at Fort Bliss? Uh, two years. What all did you, did you do down at Fort Bliss? Did you have training uh, in artillery? Well, or? I took I took the uh, the basic course, which was I think uh, six weeks or nine weeks. I can't remember, but it was the artillery basic course, which you go to school, and uh, then I was assigned to a training uh, battalion, and ba and uh, the trainees that came into our uh, battery were the. Uh, were uh, operating uh, uh, radar sets, and that's that's <coughs> that's what uh, that's what I spent the next the rest of the two years doing. You you were training most of the other uh, fellows the last couple of years. Right, I, I wasn't actually training because uh, the uh, the training was done by NCOs mostly, and. Uh, uh, but I was the, uh, in other words, there was a there was a battery commander, which is like a company commander in the artillery, battery commander, and I was, um, I think I was the executive officer. Were you still a second lieutenant at that I time? I was still a second lieutenant. At, I think at the end of 18 months, they promoted me to first lieutenant. And you said that a lot of the training was done by NCOs for somebody that's not familiar with the military 25 years down the road watching this. What's an NCO? Well, that basically that's the sergeants and uh, the 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 uh, w which are there are many many ranks of sergeants starting starting with buck sergeant, which is three stripes, and then a, a staff sergeant and master sergeant, and and the, these guys. And there's also uh, 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 <coughs> so so these are the guys that that uh, know how, know how to operate the equipment. Okay. So you, you're down there in Fort Bliss for a couple of years, and is Linda with you all that time? 
Yes. Claudia with you all that time? Yeah, yeah. But after she, well, she's yeah, born. Yeah, after she's born, she was with us. Where'd you go from Fort Bliss? Then I came back to Washington, D.C. For how long? Uh, I was uh, uh, back, I got back in 65, June, basically June of 65. And then, uh, then uh, in 1966, uh, uh, not, not, let's see, got hit there in June, uh, in uh, March or so, Linda got real sick and uh, she was uh, hospitalized and it was uh, 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 colitis, which is a, a problem in your large intestines. Anyway, and then uh, in April, uh, she passed, unfortunately, and it was very sad. I was devastated. I'm sorry, sorry about that. And uh, so, so, uh, so what, what did you do with Claudia? Well, at the time I was, uh, I was living with my in-laws at that time, and we were, I, we had plans to build a house, and uh, I was, uh, I had to sec secure some land, and uh, this was sort of moving forward, but uh, obviously it all stopped when, uh, uh, when Linda passed. So uh, uh, I was, uh, uh, it's hard to describe at this point, but it w I was not in a good place. And uh, I decided I was gonna go back in the army. So when, when had you, Gotten out of the army. I'd gotten out in in June of 1965, and I was uh, I was still a reserve uh, first lieutenant. So by uh, and then uh, in 1966, uh, uh, April of 1966, we were less than a year later is when Linda passed, and then I uh, contacted the army. Uh, it's a blur to me how I did it and got it all straight, but uh, they, they uh, I told them if I, I wanted to go to ranger school first and then uh, uh, I would come back. And uh, this was really at the, the height of the Vietnam War, so they, were, they wanted anybody they could get. Well, bef before you did that, what'd you do? Did you have a job before you went back in? Oh, uh, well, I went back to work for Pepco. Okay. When I got back in 65, June 65, I went right back to work for Pepco, and that was, uh, um, that was, uh, they'd give me, I'd gotten some kind of a raise, so I was making okay money, and. Uh, so did they keep your same job since you were, went into the service, or did you have to uh, Basically, maybe not the, uh, it, it, the first year I was with Pepco was a sort of a training program. A lot of it was a training program, and then I got, I ended up in uh, the, one of the engineering divisions for transmission, uh, the, the overhead lines and the underground lines. Uh, I was in that uh, section, and when I came back, I uh, returned to not the same desk, but uh, the same uh, division, the underground uh, and the uh, overhead division of, uh, they call it transmission and distribution engineering. So I worked there uh, until, uh, and I was working there when Linda passed. And then uh, in the fall, I, I started uh, finalizing this, uh, Return to the, the army, and on and in, uh, uh, so she died in April, and then the following uh, January, I was on my way to uh, Fort Benning to go to Ranger School. Well, I show here on your DD 214 that uh, your date of entry was January the seventh of 1967. Right, that, that sounds right? right. Yeah, she died in 1966 in April. And then in January 1967, that's when I went back in. And then I, and I reported to Fort, Bl uh, Fort Benning, Georgia for the nine-week ranger, ranger course. Why did you want to be a ranger? Uh, I, you know, when you're young, 
you know, you, you got a lot of macho feelings, I'm sure everybody's like that. So I thought, well, if I'm gonna go back in, I might as well uh, go in well-trained. If I'm gonna go to Vietnam, I might as well be as well-trained as I can. So I figured that was a good place to start. What kind and, of things did you do uh, down in Georgia for ranger training? Well, they, it, it was, it, basically it's, uh, it's uh, patrolling and uh, they, we spent three weeks at Fort Benning and uh, uh, obviously there's a lot of uh, physical exercise, running and things like that. And uh, uh, then we went uh, uh, for three weeks, after, the next three weeks was in uh, Dahlonega, Georgia. That was called the mountain. And we mountain climbed and uh, got cold up there. And uh, uh, we did rappelling and all these things. And uh, Do you have overnights there? We, we, we stayed there, yes, we stayed there for three weeks. And uh, the, the long patrol was, we were out for three weeks, uh, th uh, for six days, just basically moving. What'd you sleep in? Uh, on the ground. Did you have a sleeping bag or did you have tents or anything? No, I, I think I had a poncho. I had a poncho. I did not have a sleeping bag, I don't think. I can't remember. No, I, I'm sure I didn't have a sleeping bag. We just, we just put up our poncho to keep the rain off. And, uh, and we were moving all the time. We didn't get much time for sleeping on that patrol. So what time of the year are we talking? Summer, winter, this spring? Was a, this was the winter. And they, they used to call the, the, uh, the uh, that particular, now every, every nine weeks there'd be a new, there'd be a new uh, uh, class of rangers. And that one that started in January when I started, they call that Frostbite Six. I think it was the last one of the physical year. And uh, it was uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, problem that they, that everybody faced was frostbite. And, and it started with your ears, so the, the cadre, in other words, the instructors, were always careful to, to uh, make sure that if, if you were getting it, that they would catch it because it could be very bad. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen to me, but, uh, but you're cold and wet a lot for that, uh, that, that second three weeks. Then from there, we went to um, Eglin Air Force Base for the, what they call the, the uh, jungle phase. And that and, was located where? Uh, well, it's, it's down, uh, let me see, near Fort Walton Beach in Florida, Florida in, the, in the Panhandle. And it was Eglin Air Force Base uh, right near there that was part of, the, uh, was part of that base. And uh, we did river crossings and uh, uh, we uh, went on, uh, uh, took rubber boats down the rapids of a river. It was very, fortunately, we, we, had, uh, we had with us in our group, we had, first of all, we had a bunch of Marines that were, uh, uh, that were taking the course. And then we also had six Navy SEALs. And uh, when we were in, uh, when we were down in Florida, when they, when you needed somebody to swim a river, they were the guys, and they they could do it. Those Navy SEALs. So, so uh, did you have any uh, fake Vietnam villages that uh, you you went through down there uh, at Eglin? Uh, there, there were aggressors that that in during our patrolling and everything. I, I don't remember any any uh, Vietnamese villages, but some of it. Usually, we would we would get attacked, and, and we were just trying to stay stay awake most of the time. And uh, but no, I don't remember any any Vietnam. Uh, I know there I know there were such things in in some of that training, but. Not that, not, I don't remember for, for this, for the Ranger School. Well, how long were you in Eglin? Three weeks. So it was a total, three, three in uh, Benning, three in Dahlonega, and three in Eglin for the nine weeks. And then, and then it was, it was home and eat all you want. <laughs> one of the things they did when we were in Ranger School, particularly in the, after the, after the, the, 
the bedding phase was they systematically starved you. They didn't give you food, as much food as you uh, It was just, and moving all the time. Just constantly moving. It was, it was good training. I mean, it toughened you up. Did you lose weight? Uh, I didn't lose weight, but I tell you, there were some there were some chubby boys going in, and but none of them came out that way. <laughs> there, I, I, there were some big weight losses, uh -huh. and uh, I, I remember one of the things I remember about it was that uh, uh, I had uh, calluses. You know, everybody gets calluses on your hands if you're, particularly you're working with your hands. I had calluses on top of my hands. I don't know, I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but I had them everywhere, all, all over my hands. And, I, you know, six months later, they all went away. But that's how tough it was. How did, what was the transportation from base to base during this nine weeks? Did you, did you go well, by military transport? Right, we went from, like, for instance, to go from Fort Benning to Dahlonega, we just got on buses. And then when we went from Dahlonega down to, to Fort Walton Beach, Eglin Air Force Base, we got in buses. But the rest of the time, we were on the, we were just on the ground. Uh, okay. We didn't see anybody. Uh, we, 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 there, was, there were no civilians around. Like, if you go to an Army base, you, you see a lot of civilians around. There were no civilians, and uh, the only pe other people you saw were aggressors that were part of the training. So when you finish your nine weeks, you go back home and you get some good food. Uh, where was home at that time? Uh, it was it was uh, it was in the uh, uh, same place. I, this is my mother and father's house. But I, I will tell you that. Uh, when, when Ranger School was over, first of all, they uh, at the end we, we had an 18-mile hike, a night hike, and then uh, and then the next morning we, they had a big uh, feast for us. I mean, they, they provided it like a like a uh, all you can eat and just and uh, th then then I remember the next thing we did uh, the next night or something. I remember going to a restaurant and ordering two full meals. I think I got a. <laughs> Uh, I got a, a sirloin steak, and then I said, oh, "This done it." I then followed it up with a uh, seafood platter. <laughs> I couldn't believe I could eat that much, but it was. Well, how did you get home? Bus, I had train, a car. Plane? I had a car. You driving? I drove. I had my car then. That was the car. I, I, when I graduated my uh, from college, I got I got a car, and I still had that same car. That, that wasn't that long. You know, it was, so I just drove home. Well, did, did you take that car with you from base to base? No, no, it, it stayed at, uh, it stayed at Fort Benning. It was on, it was, it, I remember we drove it into a lot that was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't in the, on, on the base proper. It was out, out in the boonies someplace. And all the, anybody that had a car, that's where they parked it. And it just stayed there. And I'm surprised it, it started when I, but it did. I'm, I'm sure there were some problems like that, but they were, I'm sure, ready to jump anybody that uh, car was sitting there for nine, sitting there for nine, nine, nine weeks. weeks is, uh, it could happen. So how long did you get to stay home? I, 30 days. I believe they gave me a 30 day leave and then, and then I had to, uh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Because my first, after that, then I was I was uh, assigned to the 101st Airborne Division, which is in um, uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So I, I I I mean I was home for a couple of weeks at least. I could have been longer, but then then I got in the car and went headed for uh, for Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which, like I say, was the home of the 101st Airborne. And at that time, there there are three brigades. Two, one brigade was already in Vietnam, and so uh, uh, the uh, the other two brigades. I, I obviously was. Uh, uh, I remember there was a. Um, uh, I, I was assigned to a company, and uh, I think I was uh, executive officer, and uh, I, I made one jump while I was there. I was supposed to, I was going to make another one, but uh, the winds were while we were in the air, 
flying around to the drop zone. The, the winds got too high, so they, they canceled it. So I had one jump while I was at uh, Fort Campbell. And then, then, then I got uh, orders to go to Vietnam. Okay, well, let's, let's uh, stop right there for okay. a minute. Where, where had you had any training for, for jumping? Oh, well, I, I got, uh, when I was in uh, Fort, uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, the, uh, uh, let me think, it was uh, January of 19... Uh, uh, 64, I believe. Yeah, January 1964. I, yeah, that's because that's that's when my oldest girl was was born in January of 1964, and uh, so anyway, uh, uh, the uh, the it, when you're in when you're in the army, I guess you're in any organization. People of like rank kind of congregate. So all the lieutenants. You know, kind of hung around, and you know, and we were in uh, El Paso, so like the lieutenants group would go in groups to, over to Juarez in New Mexico to have have their fun. Anyway, uh, so the word was going around that they were looking for somebody. They had a slot for jump school, which is in Fort Benning, Georgia. This is while I'm in uh, uh, okay. uh, Fort Bl El Paso, and they said there's uh, there's one slot. And there was a guy there that uh, wanted the slot. He was a regular army, but he couldn't do it for some reason, whatever. So uh, I, I, it was one of those things where I just basically said, well, I'll go, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll put my name down, you know, and next thing I know, I had the orders and I went. So I drove, I drove to, uh, um, to uh, Fort, Benning Fort Benning from El Paso and, and, uh, but, but, uh, Claudia was born on a Monday, and I and I, and I stayed around. And I had to be I had to report I think by Saturday or something like that. It was it was something like that. Doesn't the details aren't important. The thing is I hung around as long as I could, and then I thought I'll get in the car and I'll drive all day and all night to get to Fort Benning on time. And so. Uh, uh, I, that's what I did, and I, I sort of planned it out. So I got across Texas, which, by the way, uh, is uh, in, in those days. I'm not even sure now, but that's a, that's like 800 miles. So you, you can't do it in daylight. So I I I, I drove all. I, I I took off in the evening, drove all night, <coughs> and I drove all the next day, and then. Um, and I was, I had these things, these, uh, um, it wasn't coffee, but these little pills, they were caffeine pills. They no were, dose? It wasn't no dose, it was something stronger than I picked up someplace. Anyway, I'd pop one of those and boy, my eyes would flip open. And then, but anyway, I, but, but the, uh, the thing that, that I realized is I could, I could, I, I took off on a, on a in, the, in the afternoon, like, five or six o'clock in the evening. I went over to the hospital, saw Linda and the baby and Claudia, and, you know, and then I went back, got in the car and took off. So I drove with a little light all night, then drove the next day all day. And uh, I should have probably been somewhere in Alabama or whatever that next, maybe Mississippi, I'm not, I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm, I'm heading for Georgia and uh, <coughs> what I what I noticed was that uh, after all night, all day, and then it went dark again, no pills helped. I couldn't keep, I couldn't stay awake, and I'm driving, you know, at 60, 70 miles an hour, and uh, I I remember that uh, I was I got into Selma, and then and then the next thing I remember was being in a, the next town east of there and I said I, and I didn't remember anything that happened in between I said and I thought I gotta stop now I, I, I'm lucky I, I, I haven't had a crash or something so I stopped and uh, got got in a motel slept a little bit and then went to went on the, to Benning by noon and uh, checked in and that was a three-week course 
and uh, we basically jumped out, jumped five times, and that qualified us, and then I was uh, airborne. So now when you, when you jump, you get paid a little bit more, don't you? Correct. If uh, uh, It's not much, though. It was, I, 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 the number $60 a month, which is, uh, it's hard to, hard to translate that to today, because 60, $60 is not much money to be doing today. something like that. Yeah, today, <laughs> yes. So, uh, but there was, there was, uh, but I only got that, I got that while, when I was assigned to the 101st Airborne in, in Kentucky, but uh, just being qualified, you know, didn't mean I got that. Okay. Uh, just uh, for nothing, uh, for, uh, at a regular uh, post. No extra money for jump school? No, no extra money. All right. No extra money for ranger school either. So, uh, let's uh, talk about your DD-214 down here in your major, in your major courses, oh. right there, uh, in your first stint before you go back in, uh, wh what are those? Gosh, are those I don't have my glasses, oh. let's see. Um, it was counterinsurgency. Oh. So what, what does that mean, counterinsurgency? Well, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea. It is probably some course, something, I mean, there was always some kind of qualification the Army would come up with, like uh, they, you'd have to go to the, uh, to the gas chamber and uh, use your gas mask and then you were qualified to check, check you, you did that. It's probably something like, I, I don't know, I can't. I can't I have no idea what that was. It was some school apparently I had to go to. Well, during that period of time, uh, you you were noted to be a parachutist. <coughs> yeah, that's from going to, to jump school. Yeah. And you also had decoration as a basic missile man. You got a badge for that? Uh, I, I guess so. I, th I think that was strictly for going through the officer's basic course for the air defense artillery. That qualified me for that basic missileman's badge. But you got the badge. I got the badge someplace. <laughs> um, when you were in reserve, you were in the reserves after you finished your first tour, correct? I was in the inactive reserve. In other words, uh, no meetings, no nothing. No, uh, no, a, uh, unit that I had to go visit or anything I had, that had me on their rolls. I was totally inactive, meaning I could be called up to a, and fill in for somebody for, uh, in, in some unit, but I was not in an active unit. Well, at that time, were you in the 21st U.S. Army Corps? Uh, I guess that's what the, that's probably where the whole, what was whole, the holding unit that I was in. Yeah. Well, that, that's what your DD-214 tells me. Yeah. Um, but and that wasn't for long because that, I was June and I was back, the back following in December, January. January, I was back in. Yeah. So, uh, where were you when you got your orders to uh, go to Vietnam? Uh, I was in, uh, uh, at the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, I suppose they, they were delivered to me, hand delivered to me because that's, uh, you know, that's normally the way they would do it. Uh, you, did you did you anticipate you were going to be going to uh, Vietnam? Yes, I had volunteered, so I thought figured you know I volunteered, so now let's get it over, get going. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't want to postpone it for any particular reason. I just thought I, I'm going to I'm do it and then get it over with, and then that'll be it'll be over. But I, there's no use just sitting around prolonging it or waiting around for anything so uh, and and at that particular time 1967 they they were they were uh, they wanted all the warm bodies they could get they were, they were losing officers at a pretty good rate weren't they I'm not sure about that but after I got there I found out yeah particularly second lieutenants were you a first lieutenant when you uh, left Fort Campbell, or were you a second lieutenant? I was a, I was a first lieutenant. Okay. So where did you go from Fort Campbell? Okay. First of all, I went home, 
and uh, I, I believe I got to stay home for some period of time back in in uh, Maryland and then uh, uh, while I was in Fort Campbell I knew I'm, I'm headed for uh, uh, Vietnam uh, but th there was one stop first the uh, uh, when I got home, I, I, but at Fort, while I was at Fort Campbell, when I got those orders, I realized I got to get rid of my favorite car, which was a, it was a convertible, Chevy convertible, it was a beautiful car. And uh, I, I hated getting rid of that car, but I, I, so I sold it. And then I, uh, I started uh, uh, an adventure of sorts. I, I call it this because I did this a lot when I was in Vietnam is I just went to the, the wherever the local uh, air base was and just wandered around in there trying to, uh, trying to find a way to get back to Maryland. And I can't remember where I even came in. It could have been Andrews or something. But in other words, uh, I, I was able to just get a flight back on uh, on a I think it was a C-130 to tell you the truth I can't remember but it was not a commercial airline so that got me back there and then when I uh, when I uh, uh, got my orders I went home spent some time at home with uh, my daughter and my mother and father and uh, my in-laws and then I uh, uh, since I was air defense artillery, and basically in Vietnam, they didn't need any uh, air defense artillery officers. Turns out they, they had a few, but they, they, they didn't, what they needed was field artillery. People that could uh, run an FDC, fire direction center, or were forward observers. Forward observers is what they needed. So, so they said, we're going to send you to... Um, and this was all my orders. We're going to send you to Oklahoma, to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where the art, which is the home of the field artillery school, Army Field Artillery School, and uh, and give you a crash course in uh, field artillery. So from uh, so my orders said what date I had to, I had to report. So I was home, and then I got on a commercial airline. Flew to uh, Lawton, and uh, and uh, took that course, and found out how to shoot, how to how to adjust artillery, and I, I I think it was like a three week course or a four week course, something like that. Really intense though, it, because it was so it was, short. It was intense. It was short. <laughs> Uh, it, it was it was intense, yes, but it was there was no harassment or anything like that. It was not you know they were they just wanted you to learn how to do it. They didn't want to they didn't want to make you miserable or anything like a lot of these uh, schools like the Ranger School was. I think they wanted you to be miserable all the time, and they accomplished that. I'll tell you. So the, what, what were your accommodations there at Fort Sill? Uh, well, it, actually, at Fort Sill was pretty nice. They had a they had a BOQ bachelor's office order that was basically a high rise. It was like a high, and uh, it was pretty nice. So I, I had a place there, and I met a couple of guys. Uh, uh, let's see. By then, let's see. I'm a second. I'm a first lieutenant, and I ran. I I think I ran into a, a captain who was taking the course, and uh, another guy. Uh, uh, and I only mentioned him because I, later on when I was in Vietnam, I ran into him at the first Air Cav. He was, uh, I happened to be up north and uh, anyway, and then, and, and so I spent, they were very nice accommodations and I learned how to shoot artillery. Well, how many hours a day were you in training and how many hours? Uh, it, was, it was probably eight hours a day and there was classroom because they taught you how to plot uh, everything nowadays, everything's done with computers and lasers and everything like that. There's nothing to it. But uh, then it was uh, uh, it was all done by hand. All the calculations were done with slide rules or uh, off charts. They had, I think, they had charts for everything, and uh, and then use protractors and and to, to do all the the calculating when you were adjusting the the artillery. So you finished that training at Fort Sill. Where did you go? Uh, 
I think I went back home. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I went back and for a, not very long this time. And then, uh, and then uh, got on a, uh, got on a commercial airliner to go to San Francisco, which was the, that was the jump off for everybody going to Vietnam. So from San Francisco. Or actually it was Oakland, Oakland, yeah. But it's right next to San Francisco. So you took commercial out to Oakland. Out to Oakland. Uh, do you remember what airline that was? I think it was TWA, but I'm not sure. Right. I can't rem can't quite remember. I know, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it was, it could have been, I don't know what it was. Right. But I do know that uh, when we went, when we left Oakland, we went on TWA. We went TWA. It was a commercial, it was a uh, charter flight, you know, just going to Vietnam. So. Did you have any stops between Oakland and uh, Vietnam? We stopped in uh, Honolulu for a, um, I guess, fuel. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Did you get off? No. They wouldn't let us off or anything. Okay. We just sat on the runway. All right. So, but uh, but yeah. I did, I could say I, I've been in Florida. I mean, I've been in uh, been Hawaii in... now. <laughs> so... So you go from uh, Honolulu, is that uh, where it was? Then we, w yeah, we had one more stop. We went to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. Okay. And uh, Clark is this humongous uh, naval base. I don't know about now. I, I'm not sure wh what it is now, but back then that was, that was one of our major uh, naval bases in that, in that part of the world. And again, didn't get off the plane. We just flew into it, and they said, "Well, next stop Vietnam." But um, you're in, you're in the Philippines now. I said, "So you check off another but country you've never been in." So you go from the Philippines. Where do you land in Vietnam? We went uh, from the Philippines to Benoit, which is a which is a, a big uh, uh, Air Force base in the south near uh near saigon and it's uh but it's it's the base where troops went in and out i mean they had plenty of uh other planes there too i mean they were they had fighters there too but the uh Tansanu was the other big air base and that was where the fighters and the bombers i think uh, basically um i'm, I'm going to take a break here okay we're rolling Okay, we talked about your uh, going to uh, Vietnam, and where was it that you landed? I landed in Benoit, which is right here, just a little north of Saigon. All right. And uh, when you got there, when what? I when I got there, I I got orders to go to uh, the 25th Division, which is over here in at Kuchi, which is right over here, just a little. A little west and a little north from the, from there, and I basically, I'm sure I got ride on a, in a on a, in a bus or a truck to get there. And who were you with? Who were you assigned to then? Uh, that when I got to the uh, the 25th Division, I went in to see this captain who was. Um, turns out, it was it was funny. He he's a, one of the heirs to the beach beachcrafts. Uh, and I thought, what are you doing here? <laughs> he, well, all your money. Anyway, so he's telling me, all, you know, the, 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 the war's not over, it's, you know, because, you know, when you get in there and you don't hear anything going on, you, you think, well, I missed all the action or whatever. Anyway, so he said, uh, well, I'll put you, put you down here. You'll be an F.O., even though usually that's a second lieutenant. He says, uh, you'll be an F.O. with A Company. And that's so... So even though I was assigned to the uh, division artillery, first of the eighth artillery, I was uh, uh, I, I actually physically went to A, A Company, First Battalion, Twenty Seventh Infantry, which is uh, the Wolfhounds, and uh, and uh, I met the 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 commander who was uh, Captain um, James Kramer. And he, he gave me a, 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 
a little go, you know, uh, orientation about what was going on and so on and so forth. But basically, I was going to be walking with him. I had a, I had a. Uh, they also signed me a radio operator, uh, who was sergeant. His name was uh, Sachs, Sergeant Sachs, Tom Sachs. And uh, he 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 goes to the reunions. I see him every year at the reunions. The reunion for the Wolfhounds. Well, the Wolfhounds. He he's there. And uh, it, it, the funny story about him was uh, my memory of him. I I I did didn't remember him after I got back. You know, there was a lot of turbulence. You know, this is when they were calling us baby killers, blah blah, and all that. And so you know, it was just you didn't talk about anything, and I sort of lost track. But uh, I, had all, I would tell people if they asked me, oh yeah, I had this little this guy from Georgia who was a little short little dude, you know, that could barely carry the radio. I remember going through a, uh, a, uh, a canal and he almost went underwater, you know, carrying that radio. And I reached out and grabbed him and pulled him up. Well, it turns out he, he grew and he's about 6'1 now. <laughs> and uh, it, just a, uh, he's an over uh, uh, long haul trucker and done all kinds of things. He's a great guy, and he's from Wisconsin, not Georgia. So uh, while we have the the map up here, uh, you spent a lot of time down here at Coochie, mm -hmm. and then where did you go? Uh, well, after the uh, after the Tet Offensive, which was in uh, January of uh, I started in 1968 in January. Uh, the, uh, I, I spent uh, time there in uh, Saigon during the initial stage of that, but later on after that, they, I, I was shipped up to uh, uh, Fubai, which is uh, up here, yeah, right here, it's a little uh, south of Da Nang, uh, or north of Da Nang, excuse me. Anyway, and uh, it was a, uh, there were Marines and uh, an Army, and it was, uh, uh, they called it the Third Marine Amphibious Force. So they had Army people there, Marines, and uh, it was. Uh, so will the map be of any more assistance to us about where you were? Or no, is that, that basically is it. That was. Uh, OK, thank you. OK. <clears throat> so let's go back to Kuchi and uh, Tell us now what's what's going on during the period of time you're down in Coochie. So, so uh, uh, Coochie, uh, uh, I'm, I'm with A Battery, a, a Company, excuse me, A Company, and I'm the forward observer. So I've got Sachs, my radio, he's carrying my radio, and they and uh, they always told you don't don't uh, walk behind a guy with a radio and hold a receiver in your hand because they know you're an officer. That's that's who they're going to shoot first, but. That, and don't walk on trails anyway, but I'm, I'm walking along with that thing in my hand because I got to talk to these people that, that are uh, providing artillery. So uh, uh, for the longest time, you know, you, you go out in the field and uh, the first thing uh, we do is uh, uh, they, they drop us in a rice paddy. So we're up to our knees in water. So there's, there's none of this staying dry business. How do we get there? Oh, uh, we went in on helicopters. They, 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 they a flight of uh, Hueys. I think it was like eight or ten, and everybody would pod, get on those. The doors were off, so you could see right through them. And and uh, then they they drop down. Everybody jump off, and uh, uh, we do our operation where we're going to go. Um, How long were you there before you had to go out on your first uh, forward observing? Uh uh, not long. It, 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 we were we uh, periodically. Apparently, the company would come back to base camp, at Kuchi, <laughs> and then uh, stay for a few days, and then go off and back out in the field. And uh, then they would go out uh, and then move around, staying in the field in different locations. So, uh, so I guess it was. Uh, I was there in uh, August. Yeah, about August. And uh, not much going on. We we would uh, uh, we would go into an area. They would go around looking for uh, try to find something, and we would find hooches. And these a lot of these areas they had moved all the civilians out, so they weren't there was nobody was supposed to be there. So if, the, if anybody was there, they were VC. 
Uh, so, uh, so what's, but, a, what's a hooch? Uh, that, uh, that's, we call the, uh, any kind of a little hut that they lived in was a hooch. Uh, uh, it basically you know, it could have a grass roof and uh, uh, I guess it had mud walls and uh, they're very, very primitive, but they lived in them. And, uh, Did you have any encounters with any of these hooches? Uh, not really, although the, 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 the grunts, that, that's the infantrymen, we were called grunts, they, they were carrying explosives and hand grenades, but, but uh, they carried a lot of C4, and uh, I, they had hand grenades also, but you gotta be careful with hand grenades because they're, uh, if you, it, with, a, with a, a, a C4, you could blow something up and there's no shrapnel coming out of it, but you throw a hand grenade in there. So anyway, they carried a lot of that and they would blow these things up and then they'd find a bunker. They, they'd blow those things up and uh, they had, uh, uh, that, that's where I, I had already learned this in, uh, in ranger school, but uh, we carried detonators and ca carried a lot of C4 and just shove it in there and uh, light the fuse, throw it in and run. So what is C4? C4 is a plastic explosive, which I believe is still used. It, it, it was, it, uh, I don't know when it was developed, but anyway, it's, uh, it's like, it, instead of dynamite, we used plastic explosives. You could mold this like clay, so you could put it on a, on a if you wanted to uh, knock a post down or something, you put a little on one side, a little on the other side, and it would just break the thing right in half with a couple detonators and a little det cord. Det cord is detonation cord. Uh, that's so you could wrap it around and you could have uh, these quarter pound, these C4 came in these quarter pound blocks, which was quite a bit, but you could uh, uh, use det cord, wrap it around and set off 16, 10, 15 of these things at one time. And cross, but we didn't do that much, but you, you, that, that capability was there. Um, was all your forward observing done by being landed in by helicopters, or did you start out uh, by going in jeeps or trucks or by foot? No, it was all, it, we, all of ours was done by coming in on helicopters, getting on the ground, and then I had a radio so that, uh, and I had a map. So my job was, and th this was this was crucial, of course. I had to look at the map and know exactly where I was. Because if I had to call a fire mission, if we, we uh, then then I would want to, uh, and and the, the, we're getting shot at from over there. I would want to give them the coordinates of where they was coming from, and and be sure what I was, what those coordinates were, that it wasn't on top of us or something, you know. But we had pretty good maps most of the time. They were photo maps, but not always. The uh, we sometimes just had just like you would see uh, a regular road map, you know. It's all drawn on there, there's no pictures. So, you know, uh, but you had to know where you were. That was, that, was the only, that was the only thing I had to know. I had to know where we were, where the company was at all times. Because if I had a fire mission, if I had to call in a fire mission, I had to give them a coordinate. I had to get it off the map and I had to make sure it wasn't on, on any of our friendlies. And uh, so, so in that sense, it was a very important job. How many were in your company? How many men were in there? Uh, the, the, the seeds, well, a platoon is uh, 30, 30 men or so. Uh, see, but about 100 is full strength. But usually we went, we, we might have 80, 90 uh, a company, maybe two, three platoons, and, uh, or two platoons sometimes. Well, how, and, many, how many radio men did you have? Well, each each um, let's see, each platoon had a had a radio, and uh, and uh, I had a radio, which w and and the company commander had a radio, and so uh, uh, so a company could have four or five radios in there. That uh, I would be on the artillery net, though. I wouldn't be talking to the same people that that. Uh, the company commander was talking to. He'd be talking to the battalion commander and to, the, to his platoon leaders. So. Uh, and who are you talking to? I'm talk. I would be talking to the fire direction center for the artillery battery, or batteries that is uh, was supporting us. In other words, in other words, if we if we got in contact 
uh, I would call the the uh, fire direction control FDC and uh, and give them a, an azimuth and and then uh, or, excuse me give them uh, the coordinates of where I thought this was coming from and then they would they would start firing and then I would adjust from there you ever have occasion to call any uh, air Isn't support that? Air support, not no. I, I never called air support uh, as a forward observer. I only could talk to the artillery. They had for air support. They had uh, they, what they call forward air controllers, a FAC, uh, who were who were fighter pilots that were in single engine propeller driven planes, and they would be flying around. And if you needed if you needed uh, 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 air support, and it was available. Then the battalion commander would talk to that to the fact who's in that propeller-driven plane, and then he would tell the uh, uh, the fighters. And and typically we would get F4s or A1Es come over, and uh, if, if they were on station, meaning if they were in, in the vicinity and we 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 needed them, he he this fact would just get them there, and they start dropping whatever we dropping napalm and bombs and whatever. When you were uh, when you were going into any of these areas where you had rice paddies and whatnot, uh, did you take any uh, fire from uh, from the VC? Uh, typically, no. So we would we would go into a, a landing zone, an LZ, and the, all the choppers would go in. And before they before we would land, the uh, artillery. The, the the liaison for the battalion would call in artillery and, and shoot artillery in the area to, supposedly to set off any landmines and if there's anybody hiding out because we're going to land out in the open and so uh, uh, once once the the, the, the the choppers came in and and dropped everybody then if you got fire then that was that was a hot LZ and uh, it could, you know, it, it could be very hot or it could be hot, you get a few rounds, but, uh, but that, was not, that was not usually the case. You usually had to go out and look for them after, after you got on the ground. Did you have any hot landings? I, while I was doing it, and I only did it for a <laughs> month to six weeks where I was, a, a, I was a, um, with a company, I was a forward observer with a company, uh, we did not have one. We did not have a hot LC. All right, so uh, let's let's go through. Uh, you land in the helicopter. Uh, now, do you, does the helicopter go down on the ground, or do you have to jump out of the helicopter a few feet? Usually, they they would just they would hover. Yes, and you jump down. Uh, I, I won't say they never landed, but basically, they you, their doors are open. I mean, they're, they're, the doors are are taken off the sides, so they're open on both sides. So as soon as that 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 uh, chopper gets close to the ground, those guys that are on the right sitting in the door, they might, and then there's a few inside. I think I, typically they would take uh, eight Americans or ten Vietnamese because they're smaller. But and as soon as you got down low enough, those in, those grunts, they're they're off. They they jump right off. They, you don't have to be. They don't have to be told because they know they're sitting ducks in that chopper. And if they, the chopper gets hit and, and flips or something like that, 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 you don't want to be in one of those. So as soon as the chopper gets close enough to the ground, they're jumping. All right. So you're on the ground, and now you're out doing what? You're, you're reconnoitering in the area? Yeah. The, uh, as soon as we get on the ground, then, then the, the company commander, you know, he's talking to the, to the battalion commander who's flying in a, a helicopter up, up about 1,000 feet. He stays up there, and uh, he, so he's flying around, and so he's talking to him, and he says, "Now go off in this direction, or go off in this, and uh, the, our objective is here." And and uh, basically, I'm just following along at that point. I, I I know what they what they're doing, but I but I'm not listening I, as a forward observer on the ground. I'm not listening to any of that that talk between the cap between the company commander and the battalion commander. So I'm just following along, staying right with him. All right. And uh, your, your radio man's with you. He's with me. And you're not behind him. You're ahead of him. 
No, I'm behind him. You're behind him. And, and I only say that because the radio's on his back, and so uh, if I don't want to get him tangled up and me tangled up, uh, I, I might be off to the side a little bit, but I, the, the, that cord goes out the back. You know, I don't want to be around in front of him. It, it just because of the being on radio being on his back, I got to be behind him. What kind of head protection are you wearing? Just a helmet, steel pot with a plastic liner. Does it, does it have a designation of your rank on it? No, no. Uh, that was no. avoided, wasn't it? Yeah, the no, no rank <laughs> and uh, no rank on, oh, I had jungle fatigues, no rank on any of that stuff. Uh, uh, I think, wait a minute, let's see. So, some of the fatigues you could get rank on them. We would put the 25th division patch on your, on your shoulder but basically, you know, a lot of guys, nothing, just nothing. You don't need it. Everybody knows who's in charge. Uh, how about how about Corman? Did you have Corman in your uh, company? Yeah, they were there, but they didn't have any special. No, I didn't see any helmets with red crosses or anything. They they were just you just knew who they were. So how long would you be out on one of these uh, missions? Well. Uh, we we would go. Uh, let's say we we would go out and they they we go in an LZ and then they might we might be down an hour or a couple hours, and then they decided well nothing here, and then we would uh, get to some area and then they say okay go over here, and uh, and they would get in positions you know they know how the helicopters are going to land the choppers are going to land and you know in two lines. And so, the, and then uh, they come in, and we get on, and off we go to the next place, whoever, wherever the, the battalion commander decided we were going. Did you get any firefights uh, during this time? There was there was only one really big firefight, and uh, that that I remember as a forward observer, and uh, it was. Um, were you down in Coochie, or were you up north? I was, I was down in Coochie. It's, it's, this was in it was on in September, so I basically got there in July, and so August we were in the field for much, and then on September fourth, and uh, and the guys in the Wolfhounds they go to the reunions they, that that were there all remember this because uh, there was there were several guys killed and uh, a lot of wounded, and uh, 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 it was significant in in that the uh, we had been out on this uh, uh, objective. <coughs> And the company was there, and and uh, the uh, so we 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 stopped in and uh, 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 the the battalion commander landed behind us someplace, and he picked up the company commander, Captain Kramer, and he was going to they were going to go off and uh, re, re, uh, do a reconnaissance of the next objective. We were going to go to someplace else. They could bring the choppers in and go to the next next objective. So we were, uh, uh, but we were advancing towards this tree line, and so it was me, and Sachs, and 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 um, and uh, Kramer's radio operator. He he stayed with us. Anyway, and uh, and. Uh, the uh, then there were two platoons. Second platoon was on the left, and the first platoon was on the right. And uh, the uh, we're advancing towards this tree line, and and it happened to be a day when I only had a uh, um, a, uh, a topo map. I did not have a photo map, so it was m much harder to figure out where we were. But but I, 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 re I remember it clearly because I had, I talked to Sachs, he, he, my radio guy, I said, I think we're right here now. He, he, I said, you see that, that, see that over there? I, this is where we are right here. This is, this is before anything happened. And I said, he said, yeah, I think you're right, sir. Anyway, so, so we then go forward and all of a sudden the, the, this, this uh, tree line erupts with fire and uh, and everybody, I, I'll speak for myself, but everybody around me dropped to the ground, and uh, it's uh, 
There were no uh, heavy machine guns, but there was a lot of uh, AKs with, that were spraying off full automatic up. And so, but, but on the left side, the second platoon, they were in the woods. They had, uh, in other words, it, it, the, uh, we, did, we hit the, our line was, we were in line, and we hit the tree line at, at an angle. So the guys on the left-hand side were the ones that took the brunt because they were basically right on top of this ambush. And I was in the middle and back. So anyway, uh, I, I had, uh, it, your training takes over then. You just, everything's automatic. I immediately got on a phone called Fire Mission. And uh, I looked at the map and I gave them a coordinate. And, uh, and uh, I said, contact Fire Mission, meaning we're in contact. So uh, what that means is that they don't have to go get all these clearances from the Arvins and make sure this and then blah, 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 and all this uh, red tape, so to speak, that would, that would slow this thing down. So I said, contact fire mission, gave them the coordinate, and, uh, and I said, one round white phosphorus, WP, which is white phosphorus. That way, when, when the round goes off, it'd be a puff of white smoke come up. Now, I say a puff of white smoke, but it's not like white smoke. Uh, if, if you're around where a white phosphorus round goes over, that stuff will stick to you and burn through your skin and kill you in a very horrible way. So, but it's very good for marking the target. And so I'm looking up and I see in the tree line this white puff of smoke come up. And, uh, and uh, in the meantime, all, all this stuff is going, uh, all kinds of things are going on. Uh, there was a couple of... Uh, 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 um, um, Sax was with me, and uh, there was there were wounded down in the front, and uh, David Steele was was running the M60 machine gun, and he was down in the front, and he kept firing into the tree line with that M60, and uh, then uh, uh, about that time, oh. I, Oh, th th oh, yeah, something happened that, that really... Uh, so apparently, the radio operator, Kramer's radio operator, called the battalion, called the battalion, who, who were off re re reconnoitering uh, another site, and, and he said, well, pull back, pull back. And uh, what, the, what this guy should have done, he should have turned to me. I was, I was the rank, I was the senior officer on the, and, and uh, he should have said something to me. He just had it up and took off running. So I'm sitting there, I, I'm talking to the artillery trying to figure out, you know, getting ready to adjust fire. And, uh, and I don't have any way to talk to the platoons because this guy with the radio has run, run for the rear. And I never saw the guy again, but I was so mad about that. Anyway, they gave him a, they gave him a medal too. That really stuck in my crawl. But that's you know things like that happen, I guess. So anyway, the uh, then on the radio comes the artillery liaison. He's a captain. So the the, the colonel had come, uh, the, the the battalion commander had come back on station, and and he says uh, you can't shoot over in that left side. That the, the the there are friendlies in, all in that woods. That was They're, your first platoon over on the left, wasn't it? Second platoon, yeah. So. They, they were over there. Second <laughs> platoon was over there, and it turns out, and I I learned this some 50 years later, because. Uh, 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 I go to, I go to the reunions and there were si there were six guys that uh, were th actually there six or seven that were there that day David Steele was one Sachs was one uh, Martinez and uh, Tom uh, t Tom uh, uh, Steiner anyway there were a bunch of guys it's it's, it's very Bill Allen Bill Allen, yeah, he, he got sh shot in the hand, and they sent him. But anyway, uh, Easy got uh, uh, shot, and uh, they sent him home. But anyway, uh, um, I learned from Tom Steiner. I'm, I'm going to these reunions, and Tom Steiner, I, I see him and, and Joe Martinez. Uh, uh, they're all hanging around together. They were both in second platoon, and so... Uh, 
there, the, there are these. Uh, now, I was a, I was an officer, but you know, at, at this point, 50 years later, this doesn't matter. We're, we're on first name basis. You know, there's no, there's no. Although, it's amazing how many people still call me sir. But anyway, uh, I got talking to Steiner. Uh, one time we were in Seattle, and a lot, not a lot of people went. And I always thought, you know, this guy's a stiff. He's not, he, he doesn't talk. He's real quiet. He stays to himself. You know, I, I you know, I, I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say, you know, I just labeled him as, you know, he's, he's a stiff. And so, so, but that day I, I told, I told Marsha, my lovely wife Marsha, that I was gonna make an effort to to interact with them. So we, took, we went with them and went to lunch, and he, he starts tell, he telling me about what happened that day. He said, uh, well, he was in second platoon, there were 11 in his squad, there were 11 in his squad, there were uh, nine were wounded or dead, there, I think there were two dead, and seven wounded, Martinez, and, and I think uh, Steiner had been shot two different places, and, and uh, uh, the uh, the only one, Martinez, the only one. Somebody else was also not wounded. Martinez wasn't wounded though, and he was taking care of everybody. And and uh, but they that hap This happened in the early afternoon. You know, like uh, I think it was two, three o'clock in the afternoon, and they didn't get picked up until after dark. So, uh, I mean, you know that that was that's that those guys. They earned their pay that day. Let me put it that way. They, they, and and Steiner, uh, you know. After that, I said, "If you want to be moody, if you want, to, that's okay. You earned it. You earned the right." And uh, we're we're real good friends now. We we talk all the time. Uh, but he was not somebody that wanted to just talk about uh, any of his. Uh, well, any of the firefights he'd been in or anything because he fr from that day on you know they they I, I left because I got promoted but uh, uh, well shortly thereafter and they got into a lot of uh, bad situations after that well how, how'd the firefight end first of all before you answer that you had mentioned Dave Steele and his machine gun uh, is is Steele with you or is he over there with second platoon uh, well, he, he was, I'm, I th I'm not sure if he was in first or second platoon, but he was in the company at that day. So he was technically at that point under my command because, because the captain has gone and I was, you know, there were, there were two second lieutenants out there someplace. And uh, I don't even know who that was, to, uh, but I was a first lieutenant and I was in the headquarters group. So uh, yes, he was. And uh, I, I always, I, I told him, I said, uh, every time he would break the, the woods, you know, they, they would open up with automatic fire. And, I, and so I, 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 I ho hollered down to him, just hold it up a little bit till we get the, the wounded back. And at that, that point, Sachs had gone forward. He asked me, uh, can I go help him with pulling some wounded guys back? I said, be my guest, go ahead. And uh, so he ran down there, and and Easy went down there, and anyway they got wounded back, and uh, uh, I, I think there were three guys killed that day though, and and they got their, all the wounded out. So uh, did they uh, get the killed out? The did they get the killed fellows out? Oh yeah, they 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 they, they didn't ever leave anybody behind. They they got the, them out. Uh, you, you mentioned Easy a couple of times, and I know he was mentioned at this last reunion. He yeah. was a, a black fellow, wasn't he? Yes, American. he was, and he was the heart and soul <laughs> of the reunion and the, uh, of the of the whole Wolfhound uh, uh, organization. He was. Uh, he was yeah. with you that day. He was with us that day. He helped pull a guy back. He, he, <clears throat> I forget whether it was him and Sachs pulling the same guy, but Sachs helped get a guy back, Easy got a guy back, and I, I vaguely, I remember it clear, but I'm not, but you can never trust your memory in certain things like this, because uh, he was standing up, and I remember being on the ground looking back, why are you standing up, and, and just, the, just then he got shot in, in the back, uh, low down though, and not, not up 
where his lungs are or anything. Uh -huh. So he went down and uh, uh, turns out they, they um, uh, medevaced him off and um, he, he, he went to, uh, he went state, but went back, back home. Uh, Bill Allen was shot in the hand. He went to Japan for a while. They sent him back. And Steiner was uh, was hit. He went he went wherever. He maybe stayed in Kuchi. Then he came back. They, they stayed just because he got wounded didn't mean you go go home. That that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, the. Um, um, well, did you call in after you do the uh, phosphorus? Did you call in uh, further artillery? No, and and the reason is, uh, like I say, this uh, this uh, the liaison, this captain who's with the with the battalion commander. I had that job later on, so I know exactly what was going on. Uh, he he's in he's he's a, a thousand feet. He can see everything. He can see where we are. He can see where the friendlies are. He can see where the tree line. Is. I mean, he's in a position to fire the artillery. You know, I got the first round on the ground, but but he was. Uh, and then uh, it turns out, you know, we got two, two gunships came in, came on station. Just, I don't know where they, they came in. And so they, they're, they're as, as effective as anything. So they're shooting machine guns, uh, mini guns, and rockets into that tree line. So they, they were, uh, we didn't need to be shooting any artillery, particularly with that second platoon over there. We didn't know exactly where they were. Like I say, they didn't get out till later that evening. After dark, they they finally got them out. So they were they were laying over there for I'd say two three hours uh, before they got out. And uh, but they got them all out. And Martinez, to his credit, you know, was the one over there. He wasn't wounded. He's over there. He stayed with them, took care of them. And I think he's the one that finally signaled a chopper to come down and and uh, help. Uh, Describe one of these gunships for us. Well, they they came in different different. Uh, well, Hueys, everybody, if you you know, Hueys pr pretty much are uh, uh, <coughs> they make <coughs> excuse me, they make this funny wop 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 sound, and uh, the uh, uh, but uh, and they carry troops and they they use for medevacs, but there are different models of them. And I think it depends on how they're inside. The the, uh, the basic. Uh, chopper is all the same but the gunships are uh they have uh they have they have mini guns sometimes in the nose and they have they have rockets on the on the sides and then they have uh, they obviously have door gunners they have each have a uh, m60 a machine gun so uh, these i think came in with rockets and 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 mini guns and so they're they're very effective, and and they can see exactly what they're doing. You, you know, if they get somebody that's not all dug in, th th they're uh, they're very effective. If, if they're well, all dug in, these are big helicopters, aren't they? Uh, not not no, they're they're not that big. I mean, uh, these Bell helicopters that you see flying around now are uh, essentially the same thing, except they're modernized. They got better engines. They're probably more powerful, and uh, but they look, they look like they're just a little, I, like it. I always say they look like a tadpole. You know, they got a big front and then they got the tail and a big rotor on top. It's just, uh, just. So there was a, there was a song that uh, was pretty popular about Puff the Magic Dragon. Oh yeah, Puff the Magic, uh, I think they, yeah, they, they had, that was a, I think that was a C-130 and it had a Gatling gun mounted in the back. A Gatling gun is, is different than a minigun. Uh, a minigun and a Gatling gun are similar in that they, I think they have six barrels and they, have a, they shoot at a very high rate of fire. The difference is that a, a minigun shoots 7.62, the same as an M14, which is a 30 caliber round. And the, uh, the uh, Gatling gun Shoots a 20 millimeter exploding round, so it's it's much more devastating. And they they mount it in the back of a, a C47, and then and they use it primarily at night. And they would they, there's area weapons. That, so if they know the VC are in a certain wooded area or some, they'll fly over and then they just they just take the wing and and uh, just 
rock the plane a little bit and that, that stream of fire of 20 millimeter around you can carry a lot of ammo if you're in a, a cargo plane so uh and they they call them puff the magic dragon you know because at night i mean you don't want to see them shooting at you i'll tell you that they're just because those rounds are 20 millimeters that's big and they're exploding so so you uh the gunships come in and they they take care of the the tree line and you guys get evacuated uh, by helicopters. The the wounded, right? Well, how about you? No, we stayed there. The uh, uh, it was dark by then and they didn't want to they didn't want to come in at night and try you know bad things happen in the, when it's all dark like that. I mean it was not necessary. We had the we were secure, so we just basically slept out right there where we were, just slept on the ground. And uh, the next morning, uh, Sax and I, uh, and by the way, during the night, I, you could hear these VC. You, you hear from the tree line, you could hear them talking, and then they moved away. So they, they evacuated out of there. And, uh, and uh, so we just slept out there. The, the colonel came in and he brought in another company, and the, 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 whole, the whole battalion basically s slept there that night in the on that in that field where the where we, we were ambushed and the next morning so the next morning uh uh sax and i um it uh we uh i said come on we'll go check out the this this uh this tree line and and we went back in there and these uh they had a, a trench line trench system in there and it wasn't just one long trench it would have it would have turns so that if a round went off, a, a direct hit went into one of these trenches, you know, it, there would be a, a very uh, limited uh, damage. It wouldn't go all the way up and down the line because the thing would turn. And then and, and in addition to that, they had what they call these little spider holes, what I call them. And they could, they, in the trench, they could get back in into a spot and uh, and basically, you'd have to have a direct hit right on the, on that part of the trench. If you were three or four feet up from that, the guy in the spider hole, he he survive. So so we're going on looking at seeing how it is, and you know this is just awful. You know, uh, no wonder we couldn't uh, couldn't do much damage to these guys. They're they're shooting at us from where they were. They were totally. But, but what, what happened, and this is what I, I was rep mentioning in the fog of war. I, I recall, um, we, we, so we're going up and down, going down this, walking down this trench line, all of a sudden we see this guy. He's basically naked except for a loincloth, and he's, he's squatted down in this trench. And, uh, and this is the way I remember it. Uh, 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 Sax turns to me and says, "Can I shoot him? Can I shoot him, Lieutenant? Can I shoot him?" I said, "I said, Sax, you can't shoot him he's, unless if he's if he's got a grenade hidden, you know, you could shoot him, you know." And I'm, I mean, this is a little dicey here, uh, obviously, because uh, uh, and uh, but what's what's interesting about the story uh, is is the way your how your memory you, you can't be sure of your memory eyewitness memory because. Uh, I, I asked him about that 50 years later or so one time I just I was talking but we were talking I said do you remember that he says I don't remember that so I said I let it go so what did you do with this guy did you we took him out and uh, <clears throat> they, we gave him to the Arvins which is pro probably shooting would have been better because the Arvins would probably torture him and who knows what, what they and the Arvins were who the 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 the, uh, the Arvins were the the South Vietnamese Army, and they had they, look they they look the, the VC and the NVA you know they went in and they murdered people in the South and so 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 these uh, you know we're we're coming in from the outside and we're, we're you know we're we're not subject to any of that so you know these guys these Arvins they they could have family members murdered by the just coming through, they would kill village chiefs and things like that. So I, I don't judge that at all. I, I have no 
no judgment about that. It's, uh, oh, when, you, <clears throat> when you go into the tree line, uh, were there dead bodies? Uh, no. Enemies? They, they're no different than us in that sense. If there were any dead bodies, they took them. We didn't find, except for this one guy. I don't. I, I, I never, never understood what, how he got left there. Do you know what he was? Do you know whether he was? Uh, no, I never. We VC never, or what? Well, we assumed he's a VC. Uh, at least he was with them. He wasn't. You know, I mean, first of all, if you were a certain age, and and you weren't in the army, you were a VC. I mean, there were many. There was a lot of uh, people that that's the way that was their mindset. If you're if you're 18 to 25 and you're not in the South Vietnamese Army, you're a VC because you should be in the army. Uh -huh. So uh, <clears throat> so anyway, but that that's that's a little bit political, and I, I don't. But that that was your that was your worst experience as far as a firefight. Yes, that was <laughs> where I was actually on the ground. Now later on, when I became the liaison, the artillery liaison. That meant I, I was in the I was in the chopper with the uh, with the battalion commander, and anytime they need artillery, I'm the one they call the artillery, and uh, so uh, I I I don't know how many firefights I witnessed from that position, but that position, I guarantee you, is a lot different than an infantryman's position who's down there, you know, on the ground, uh, walking point. Or on the on the wing, you know the the guys in the center are always the, the safest. The the guy on point and the guys on the wing, the infantrymen that are out there, they're the ones that are that, that that's where the mortality is because they're the one that springs the ambush. And so, so anyway, but I was I witnessed fire many 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 firefights from that thousand foot position shooting artillery the whole time. And uh, and uh, it, it's um, it's a helpless feeling. And I remember once we we were in this big firefight uh, down on the ground. And I remember uh, we were uh, flying near Trangbang. It was near near a built-up area. And I remember looking off in the distance and people going up and down the road on bicycles and. And, and I thought, and here, here the, out here we got a big fight going on. And they're just, they don't have no idea what's going on. It's just a little surreal. But I thought, you know, other people in New York City don't know what's going on either. <laughs> it was just, but, but Did there you was. Did take any fire on any of those? No, uh, they, they didn't. They, they didn't in the South. They did not try to shoot at helicopters because they're, they're, the, the pilot seats were arm, armored. And the uh, those the, the, they're they're made to take a lot of uh, bullets. If you didn't have like uh, like uh, Hanoi Jane and her uh, anti aircraft gun, if you had one of those things to shoot, then then a helicopter is vulnerable. But just from small arms, not much. You know, all you're gonna do is give away your position. If if the, if the door guns are paying attention, you you don't you don't, you don't want to be shooting at helicopters. They they're they're in a better position, but when I when I was up there, I, I remember one particular instance where uh, we had a uh, 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 is a fairly big big firefight, and uh, typically they went like this: the the, the infantry is moving across some open area, they hit a hit a spot, and uh, the the VC are dug in. And they get some casualties, and they pull back, and then they say, uh, uh, st "I would start shooting artillery immediately. I'd call a fire mission immediately, and I might have a battery, which is six guns. So that means every time I say uh, battery battery three, that means each gun fires three sh three rounds. That's 18 rounds on the ground, and and I." I Typically, I would fire at battery three and then and then move. And if it was a tree line, you know, I'd move down the tree line and and just like that, and then back up the tree line and maybe go back into the tree line. And if I had two batteries, if I had two batteries firing, then I would uh, uh, they then I would have 12 guns. And the the only problem with that is that if they were not co-located, co in other words, in the same 
physical location. They could be, you know, a couple clicks away in, in some other some other fire base. And then and everything all my adjustments were made on gun target line. What that means is that uh, I could see from ab above that w where the where the guns were. I knew where the guns were. I knew where the target was. So I just draw a line um, um, uh, in my mind. And, and if I wanted the rounds to go right, it would be on the gun target line. And so. Uh, it was uh, so. So you had to be. You had to be. If you're firing two batteries, you had to be very careful because each one had a different call sign, and then you had you had to remember which gun you, which battery you were talking to. So if they were on, if they were on either end of the thing, then if you were here, if you're shooting this this battery, you would say and and it would be right. But if you're shooting this one, it would be left if you're trying to get the round in the same spot. So well, all I'm saying is you could not lose concentration in the job I had. And, and uh, I never thought about it much because when you're young, you can do that kind of thing. You can, you can hold your, att your attention, you know, you can force yourself and your, your mind is capable of it. I, I know I, I, it wasn't until years later that I realized that uh, the older you get, the less you can do that kind of thing, and it's a good thing I didn't. I, 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 that's why they have to have young people doing that because, and, and as far as I know, I, I, I did, did a, I got a count, a few counts some from uh, from uh, engagements, and uh, one particular uh, big firefight we had. Uh, uh, the uh, I fired a lot of artillery. I had a couple bat, one battery firing smoke because these. The, the unit was out, the, the company was out in the open. It was a dry season and uh, they were in a rice paddy and they were, they, they were in the middle between the dikes. And anyway, it was a very bad situation. So I was firing a lot of smoke in there and then I was firing also HE from another battery. And so uh, uh, at the end, in my two or three hours, I don't know, the, 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 uh, the this captain, I, I knew who he was. He, he was, uh, he he ran the fire direction center. You know, he's the one that had all these guys doing all the plotting and all that. And he's the guy I talked to on radio. Well, no, I didn't. Actually, he he had a, a radio operator that took took all the. But anyway, he he calls me up and says, uh, first of all, he called me and uh, during the mission and said, "You're using a lot of smoke." And I says, "We got a lot of people in, that are in the open." He says, okay. So, he, and at the end, he said, you fired 4,500 rounds today. Wow. And I thought, 4,500 rounds. And I thought about it for a minute, and I thought, well, I got, you know, when I buy ammo for my rifle, you know, if it's, they come 20 to a box. If I shot five boxes, that's 100. That's a lot of ammo. And then 45 times that, you know, and I thought, well, there's a lot of room for a lot. There was room for a lot of very tragic mistakes if I if I wasn't on top of on top of it, and apparently I was because I if if I'd have shot a short round or or, or if I if I'd have actually said right instead of left and hit friendlies, I would have known because they would have told us and and that that it would have been, I mean that would have been tragic if that happened, but it never happened. So I, n I never shot any, I never hit any friendlies. And I, di I didn't realize how important that was until many years after I left Vietnam. But anyway, I was telling you about this time we got in this big firefight. And uh, the, I remember there's this one lieutenant, he's a platoon leader. He's kind of a quiet guy. And, and the officers hung around a little bit. Now I was a captain at the time. So we would get in base camp and there'd be a little bit of uh, BSing around, and, and but not much because once you get back in base camp, you know you had a long day, and and you get you get uh, you get some to eat, and then you want to go to sleep and whatever. But uh, this guy, I remember he was he came into the company, and he was a big guy. He's about six, I'd say he's six 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 seven, and maybe two thirty forty something like that. He was not a little guy. And uh, anyway, that day he he was he was in the in in part of the the company that that sprung this ambush, and so 
They pull back. I, I didn't know at the time. They pull back, and I started shooting artillery, and and it was a it was not a big target. In other words, it was it was maybe a hundred yards, maybe two hundred yards, and maybe fifty yards. That that's where I was shooting. So you know, and I just for a couple hours I pummeled the place, and. Uh, and uh, I, I, I never thought about it, but I knew some, there, there was somebody in there, friendlies, probably, hopefully they were, they were already dead, who knows. But anyway, the, uh, so, the, uh, so eventually I stop, they go back in, and uh, they find this guy, and uh, they got a body bag, well, I, think, I think we even gave Anyway, they had a body bag. You put him in a body bag, and they said, we don't have a, they're, they're not going to get a dust off. There's no, it's just a, you know, he's dead. So uh, you don't want to uh, call the, the medical, the medics, you know, you don't need a doc. He don't need a doctor. He doesn't need a corpsman. So, they, so we went down to this command ship, me and the colonel, the battalion commander, and his S3, and they loaded this body bag in right at my feet. And it was this guy. And it was this great big long. And they put it on the, put it on the chopper. And I used to, uh, you know, I, the, the colonel in, in one of these helicopters, there, there's seats for the, uh, there, there's, there's a row of seats up against the, uh, uh, there's a row of seats where the bulkhead is. And then on the other side is the pile and co-pile. And I'm sitting in the back and I got this little half door that I used to use. I used to take a grease pencil and write write information down, you know, uh, a time of flight, things like that, and uh, and write it on the window. And so I'm sitting back there, in the, no doors on this thing, uh, and and then uh, 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 I'm just sitting. In, I'd, I'd take my steel pot off, lay it on the ground, and just sit in it. That, that was my seat. That was my seat. And uh, they put this guy on. We took him back, and I thought, I guess this this could. I just this. I used to know this guy. I used to talk to him, say hello to him. And I know he was just in bad. I mean, he was there where I was shooting all that artillery. He was not in. He must have been all beat up. Mm-hmm. But. He was dead, so. So, uh, how long were you down there, uh, Coochie, before you go up uh, north? You know, it was. Uh, <coughs> it was. Um, I think, I was there in Coochie from July to about March. Or April, maybe. And um, then they shipped me up to. Um, Fubai, and I went into a headquarters, and uh, even then, uh, even there, you know, there were there were some other officers. There were there were a bunch of us. Uh, one guy got promoted to major while we were there, but they were but basically infantry. So anytime they needed somebody to, to, to that, that could shoot artillery, they they get me and say, you you go out here. And uh, 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 I remember uh, one particular time. Uh, we were uh, we were there, and they said we need somebody we need somebody to shoot uh, to just artillery from a, from a O1E, uh, which is a little single engine, uh, two place. You know, the pilot sits behind you, and you sit in front of him. It's like a, like a Piper Cub, like, like basically. And uh, they said uh, report over here. You, you you know, and so I I, I go over there. And so they're talk, they're sitting around, uh, or they're, they're they're briefing people, and he said, uh, so uh, this guy says to me, he says, okay, now you're going to be flying the low plane, and uh, this lieutenant, oh, he's going to be flying the high plane. I said, what do you mean the low plane, the high plane? He says, well, you, you'll be down a thousand feet, and uh, and uh, so where you can see. You know, because we were flying over the Ashall, the Ashall Valley, which was uh, uh, famous for that's where they had these anti-aircraft guns, like uh, Jane Fonda would sit on and get her picture taken. 
our, our, our sweetheart, Jane Fonda. Anyway, so, uh, uh, and so uh, this is not, any aircraft guns will definitely shoot down a single engine Piper Cub type plane. <laughs> They, they, if they hit a, uh, uh, an F-4, they'd probably shoot one of them down too. So, so he said, uh, he said, so you're going to be flying the low plane and you'll be doing, you'll be calling this. I said, well, what's the guy up there doing? He says, oh, well, if you get hit and go down, he'll mark where you go down so we can send somebody to get you. <laughs> that makes you feel real good, doesn't it? It was, it was a... Uh, I, it, what was amazing about it is I didn't think, I said, oh, okay, as long as you're going to come and get me. <laughs> so, anyway, so I, I thought, you know, this is it. I'm, you know, uh, I, this is, I'm gonna really going to get it this time. And so I'm, I'm walking out the door, to, headed for the plane, and they says, up, oh, come back. We cancel that. We cancel that. I went, oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, it's funny, uh, you know, I, I always thought, you know, there's, you know, there's fate and there's being in the right place in the right time and all, all that. And, and it, it, you know, it was, it was the, the second time something like that happened to me because when I was in Coochie, uh, they said, uh, I actually knew about, I had heard about this big firefight. I'm in, I'm in base camp now. I'm not out there watching any of this. But they said uh, they, they've been uh, such and such a, a, a battalion or whatever is in this heavy firefight out there and they've been shooting artillery all day and they're, they're running low on ammo and we need, to send, we need to send ammo out to them, artillery ammo. And so uh, I said, oh, yeah, right. And he says, then, uh, so w we want you to take them out. You'll be in charge. I said, okay. So I go, I said, so report to the motor pool, or, the, or the, the, wherever they keep the ammo, where they're loading these trucks. So I go down there, and, and you know, I, I, was, I was, you're young, you have to remember, at that time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm older now, I'm not so stupid as I was then. So I go down there, and they, they've got these two, basically what they are, 10 ton, double axle, double wheel trucks loaded as full as they can get with 105 ammo. 105? Uh, 105 millimeter artillery ammunition to, to take out to this, this, uh, this artillery fire base that's running low on ammo. And it's, get, it's getting dark, it's not quite dark yet, and they said, uh, uh, they said, uh, now here we're going to give you you got you got this jeep, and then we're going to give you a uh, you're going to lead. I thank you, and uh, and then behind you we got a machine a jeep with a machine gun. Your jeep has a machine gun, and uh, and uh, it'll be it'll be trailing and the two trucks in between. I said, yeah, okay, and so I'm looking at the trucks and I'm thinking. This is again. I, I preface this with you know you're young and stupid. I, I thought, damn, I've never driven a truck this big. I like to drive this truck, and so, so I t I tell a guy, uh, there's a little spec four driver. I said, come on, come on out of here. I, he says, yes sir. I says, I I'm going to drive this truck. He says, uh, sir, I, I don't think I don't think you should do. I said, get out of the way. I get up in the truck. I said, where's the starter? He says, sir, I, I really don't think you should be driving this truck. So I, so I, and I couldn't figure out. I thought I can't even figure out how to start the thing. I better <laughs> not. So I got down, and so, uh, so he gets back up, and he was happy about that. And so I get in this jeep, and I think we're going out with two 10-ton trucks loaded, fully loaded with artillery, one RPG, and they won't find a trace of any of us. And, uh, and we're going out at dark at night, and now, it, admittedly, they don't know we're coming, you know, I, and I'm sure they, you know, it has to be dumb luck, but they want us to go, I, I don't know how many miles it was to this fire base, but uh, so I said, but you know, 
let's go. So we get in, we get in, and I'm I'm driving down to the main gate, and so we get down to the main gate, and uh, and and uh, they stop us, and they said, uh, oh, we just got a call from headquarters. You're you're uh, you're not going out. We they they fired the, they they calmed down out there. They they don't need it now. They're gonna wait till morning. And I thought, oh, that's oh well, could have been a real adventure. But in hindsight, <laughs> I say it's probably it's probably a good thing because you don't want to be out at night like that. Well, how would you see to drive down the road? Well, you'd have to turn on your lights. That's one thing. You know, they, so they would. Did you have special night? Driving no, lights? there was just there no. Not then. I, they may have that kind of stuff now, but it was it was one of those uh, stories that that I it, where nothing happened, which was which is good. Well, how old were you at this time? I was twenty seven. But the, but there are a lot of these fellows are a lot younger than you, aren't they? Oh yeah. The oh now the kid the kid he's probably twenty eighteen nineteen that was driving. Yeah yeah all these. Uh, yeah, these these were kids, and they, they were dying. A lot of them were dying. It was just oh yeah, and uh, and uh, the officers. Uh, there were a lot of those lieutenants who were killed too. It just well, how, how long were you up at Fu Bai? Well, I stay got there. I think in say March, April, and, and March was by the way. You know, I, I, I didn't occur to me at the time, but. Later on, when I got back here, and years later, I looked and I said, "Oh, March! That's when they had the Milai massacre. That's when I went to Fubai. That was after the Tet Offensive, which means, which means during the Tet Offensive, you know, there were there were a lot of atrocities on both sides, but more on their side. They would go in and, and murder villages and and." Uh, uh, you know, getting for, for sure killing all their leaders and things like that, and so uh, you know, who knows what 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 was all behind that that Milai? But you know, I, I don't tell you anything about that. You can read in the in the books, history books. I I remember hearing about it, but it's uh, so. Uh, who was involved in this Tet Offensive? Was that just uh, Viet Cong, or were there North Koreans, or? Yeah, uh, I, I it was. I think there were some NVAs. Yeah, North the North Vietnamese. I think the North Vietnamese Army was also involved, particularly up to the north, and along the border, uh, down south, like Saigon. I think that was mostly VC, but but I don't know. I don't know. I didn't. Did you ever uh, capture or any of your uh, platoons or companies capture enemy? Um, uh, Arms uh, were the arms Russian or were they Chinese or? Oh well, <clears throat> they all had AK-47s, and everybody it turns out Chinese, uh, the I think the Bulgarians, the Russians, they're made by everybody, so they basically all had uh, I think mostly Russian AK-47s, uh, Kalashnikovs. Up at up at Fu Bai, what, what, how big was your main base? Oh, it was uh, it was a big base. It was like the division base at Kuchi. It was it was how, very big. How was the perimeter guarded? You know, I never got on the perimeter. I, I'm. It was um, Kuchi was. They had a wire around it, and they had towers all around the whole thing. Uh, uh, I don't think Fubai was a regular little town, and it was real close to Wei. The Imperial City of Wei, and uh, I, I don't remember there being the same. But I, I'm sure there was something. But we were stuck. We were in the middle. I, I I was in the headquarters, so you could be sure of one thing: when you're in the headquarters, you're not close to the where they're going to. Or the enemy's wire. trying to get in. Huh? Yeah, then they, yeah, you're not going to be close to the wire. You're. Uh, well, well, take me down to Kuchi. What was the perimeter there? Well, there it was. It was. Uh, I, 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 it's hard to. to I, I didn't. All I know is, we were near 
the, the, the wolfhounds, the, our, our, our cahooches and our, our barracks, the barracks, we call them hooches. Anyway, where we slept when we were there was near the, near the fence. And the, the fence was, uh, had guard towers, machine guns in the towers, and, and, and they were all mined and claymores and all this stuff. So, I mean, they were never going to try to, all they would ever do is, uh, they would shoot rockets in, you know, they, they would never try to, a ground assault. And, and the other thing was, they had tunnels all under Coochie anyway, so they could get inside anytime they wanted, just going through those tunnels. How did you know that? Well, I didn't find it out till much later. <laughs> but even that, even today, there is a uh, you 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 can go there as a tourist, and they will take you to the Coochie Tunnels. A guy I played golf with when I was in uh, Washington or in uh, in uh, Maryland in Bethesda, the uh, uh, he 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 actually took a tour. Uh, he and his wife went to Vietnam, and uh, he he went in and saw the Coochie Tunnels. And I said, ah, been there, done that. I don't need to go there. Uh -huh. See that. But uh, yeah, apparently they were uh, they, they were very good at digging, getting dug in, and digging tunnels. And uh, the uh, I, in fact, one of the st you, you hear these stories, so you, you, you're not sure how much how much validity you put into them, but I remember there was an area called the Iron Triangle, uh, and there was a big... Uh, over, a, over toward Laos? No this, was, no, this was more in the center of the country. It wasn't on the border, but it was uh, north of Saigon, and I think a little east. Anyway, there was it was a big uh, VC stronghold, and... Uh, and uh, they did a uh, did a couple things there, but one of the things they did was uh, if you've uh, was uh, they had this thing called the Rome Plow Operation, and they would had these caterpillar tractors. I I, ca I call them caterpillars. They were probably they could have been John Deere, but I mean they're, in other words, they're tracked uh, uh, bulldozers, and they put them hub to hub. And they had 20, 20, 30 of them, and they went through these through this area. And uh, instead of using Agent Orange to defoliate, they just knocked everything flat in in the in the in that in that uh, Iron Triangle. But one of the stories I heard about the Iron Triangle is they found a big tunnel complex. So they uh, they they got the engineers in, and they said uh, they, uh, they they the, river, the Saigon River is right there, and they they so they laid this pipe and they sucked water out of the thing and started flooding this tunnel and they I don't know for days they pump water into it or some you know through this across this pipe and and it looked like it was full and then and then they watched and they heard this big sucking sound and the, the water went down and and they, they stopped doing that uh-huh now that that could be true or not true but the, the, they were very good at putting in tunnels there's no question about that and uh, it turns out that uh, uh, this Rome Plow operation with the, was, was run by, I'm not saying the whole time, but one of the guys that was in charge of it, he, he was a battalion commander at the time, was <coughs> none other than Alexander Haig, who was Nixon's chief of staff. He was then general. general. Uh -huh. And... Uh, so uh, uh, in uh, in the 80s, maybe maybe the 90s or something, I'm watching 60 Minutes, and uh, Dan Rather is talking to Haig about about this operation and how he was there. I'm talking about uh, Dan Rather was there and uh, covering this thing, and he and uh, Haig was the was this like was this a, a lieutenant colonel at that time, and he was running the operation, and blah blah blah, and I, I, because and and I had been uh, this was one of the times where I was in the headquarters, and they said yeah, you know I, about the artillery if you could shoot artillery you know they just say get in that plane go go shoot artillery out there, and they says. So they sent me out in one of these uh, 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 O1Es, the small one, single engine, two-place airplane, and, and I'm looking, 
flying over the Iron Triangle watching all this. These these uh, is, it, is it a sight to see? Yeah, they'd be hub to hub, and they just flatten everything. Now, there's plenty of places to hide where they flatten things, but that's neither here nor there. They did it, and it was a big operation, and I, I figured uh, that when I was flying over in, uh, I guess that was 67, might have been 68, and uh, and uh, could have been at the same time when uh, Al Haig was there as the lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. But well, you mentioned Agent Orange. Uh, were you ever in an area where uh, they were uh, distributing Agent Orange and you were affected well, by it? Well, you know, it's funny to say that because uh, anybody that was in country during any time is considered infected by it. And, and they even, uh, he, he, I think they've even given the same uh, a status to uh, sailors that were in the South China Sea. That shows you how they went from we, it's, there's nothing to it to that. But uh, uh, so uh, I've had heart problems. You know, I, I, had, a, I had a mitral valve repa uh, repaired and I had prostate cancer and I uh, have uh, atrial fibrillation. And anyway, all the things that they say could, could have come from Agent Orange. But I, I've I put in for through the VA I put in for a uh, a, uh, a disability and they turned me down and and uh, the, it, they turned me down twice already and what they say this is this is the part that makes me not want to give up they said well if you were if you had your uh, your arteries are only you know they they check with my I, I see a cardiologist and so they said. Your your stress test shows you're only got a 20% blockage. That's the the worst you got. We don't. If you don't have 70%, then you're not. Then it wouldn't cover. And I said, wait a minute. If Agent Orange is supposed to cause a problem, what do you mean? If 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 I've been uh, watching my weight and I've been exercising and and that's why that that I don't have all this. Anyway, I don't want to get get on a soapbox or anything. But but it's. It's very disconcerting, the uh, uh, VA well, is. Well, when you were up there in your observation plane, did you see areas of the country where they had distributed this Agent Orange? Well, now they sprayed it all over the place, in all kinds of places, in the north. Uh, I'm not sure how much in the south, but in the north for sure, they just flew over areas and, and like, like a crop duster, and only they put tons and tons of the stuff out. And uh, it's supposed to defoliate, and, and uh, particularly on, on the on the on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, it would keep the you know op open the thing up so that y you could fly over and see them moving or whatever you know without the, well, all that cover. And uh, 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 you know Zumwalt, uh, his son died supposedly from. Uh, Agent Orange. Agent Orange, yeah. The, the, well, did you ever fly over the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail? Oh yeah. We, when we were, well, when I was in the north, I, I flew over Camp Evans, and we, we would go out that way. Now they weren't spraying at the time, you know. It's a, sure, it's but a, but they had already sprayed it. Yeah, I'm sure Could they you? sprayed all over. There was all all kinds of places they sprayed, and not only that, if they sprayed anywhere over there, you know, the winds. Take it other places. Sure. So, rather than try to figure out, you know, where in Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, if they're only worried about the uh, uh, U.S. soldiers, then uh, then uh, if you were in Vietnam, they figured and it, they sprayed it someplace up in the north. It could have come down into the central part, sure. and then, or it could have come even further. Who knows? Do do we have records on with the uh, what the winds were in those days? Of course not. But so anyway, they supposedly they're they're um, they're much more lenient. In the beginning, they they just said no, we we don't accept any responsibility. Now they actually have guys getting disabilities from it. But and and I'm not saying I should get a disability. But when they say, well, you you've only got a 20 percent uh, blockage. If you you need 70 percent before we'll. <laughs> 
And I, I think, well, that's some, that's crazy. that blockage has something to do with the, with the way you live yeah. for the last 50 years. I, I th well, anyway, that's well, just my Let me take you back up into the airport. Did you go, did you fly over the Ho Chi Minh Trail before they had defoliated or was it just after? No, I, I didn't actually fly. If I'd have gone the, in the Ashall Valley, I'd have been, I would have been real close to the Ho Chi Minh, if not in it. Because uh, it, it was not a well-defined, but it was along that uh, the it was along the the western border of Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos. So did, if you're did, over that way, did they move their troops and supplies mostly at night then? It, the when they were on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they moved them at night, but day too probably. I, I mean, it was so thick back there that they, they uh, you know, I how, mean, that was. How I, close did you get to that valley while you were up north? Uh, over the, uh, I got as close as that when they told me you're the low plane, but then they, then they canceled the flight. That was the closest you got. To that was it. the closest I got. Yeah, but I heard about a lot. Everybody heard about that was in country heard about the Ashall Valley. They, they had those anti-aircraft guns there, so it was, and uh, they were not anxious to send even the infantry in there. You know, but it was there was nothing. I I I don't know. It's you know that's. That was uh, higher, higher authorities were making those decisions. Well, before we get out of, uh, out of Vietnam, what, uh, what is probably the single most or two most significant things that uh, you experienced while you were there? Either, either something you saw or something you saw afterwards? Well, they, well, they, there's actually two things I, I'll do. I'll try. I'll be quick. One is uh, we were we were uh, uh, camped over near Cambodia, uh, and I remember the colonel saying, uh, uh, the battalion commander said, uh, we, we got in this area. We went in there in the afternoon and got a, uh, set up a base, perimeter and all that. Call, I got artillery and all that, and he says, we, we can withstand a frontal assault from two regiments in this position. And of course, of course the lieutenants, you know, they, they, they're, the, the lieutenants get together and they're talking. He says, what if they send three? <laughs> anyway, anyway, while we're there, it, it, this is, uh, that's the levity. This is serious. It was, it was, there was a guy, a new guy, a new lieutenant came into the unit. And his name was um, Frank Madusky. And Frank was a good old Italian boy, and uh, just out of, uh, just, you know, just over, just in country, you know. And uh, I was a first lieutenant. And so, so we're, you know, there were, we had time after we, after we got our, and I had a radio operator, so he's setting up all my stuff. I said, go find us a place to sleep, you know, and, and uh, you know, get, and, and, and the other thing I would tell him, I said, if they send a sundry back, pack out, get me a carton of Winston's. And if they got two of them, get both of them. <laughs> I was a heavy smoker back then. Anyway, so, so I, I run to this guy, Frank. Frank Madusky, and so Frank and I, I said, yeah, Frank, and it was one of the very few times in the field where you, where I actually uh, talked to somebody and interacted with them. Now, it turns out it was mostly about things going on there, because there were things I didn't know. We didn't talk about our personal lives or any of that. So anyway, uh, 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 we spent a good hour and we went outside the outside the wire, and, and I, I told him, you know, this is and that, and blah blah blah, and and uh, then we came back, came back, same same way we went out, so that somebody wouldn't take a shot at us, and uh, and went our our own merry ways, and and I and I, I I thought, what a nice guy, you know, I hope he makes it, I hope everything's okay. Well, uh, not, not a month later, I hear uh, from somebody. I, how I did it, how I heard it, but he said, Frank got killed. I said, what happened? He says, and and I'll tell you the version that 
And it wasn't until I started going to these reunions that I found out exactly what happened. They, they fe he's out, he's a platoon leader, and he, they find, somebody in his platoon finds a, uh, a, a law uh, that uh, was fired and misfired. And the uh, uh, law is a light anti-tank weapon. So it was basically the the old, uh, what they would call them bazookas in World War II and the Korean War. But they, they had a three and a half inch, uh, 2.75 inch rocket. And so the, uh, 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 but it misfired. Now, I'll, I'll tell you right now, anybody that knows any kind of anything says you don't mess with those things. If it's laying on the ground, you put a charge, a C4, block a C4 next to it and and light the fuse and get get away. Well he got he he talked to headquarters and some major in the in in the battalion said, We got we gotta look at that thing, find out what went wrong. And they brought it and he said, get it and he said they put it on a helicopter. Big mistake and brought it back to base camp and uh, then they they had it and they were sitting around talking about it and they passed it around and got to Frank and according to uh, Martinez who was there uh, uh, he was fooling with one of the wires and it exploded. Mm. He killed Frank instantly, he killed two other guys and wounded a whole bunch of guys. And um, anyway, it's just totally tragic. You don't you don't even get a Purple Heart for something like that. So, um, so uh, that was tragic in itself, and and uh, it was just awful to hear about it. But the the story uh, it turns out that Frank had a had a he was estranged from his wife, but he had a, a, a like a one year old, and anyway. The one-year-old grows up, and uh, her, she has a half-brother who, who comes to one of these reunions, and I, we all find out. And so the guys from the that that, that were in his platoon, like uh, uh, Steiner, and uh, and and uh, Martinez, these guys uh, knew Frank, and Steiner particularly really liked him. It turns out from what I've, from just from talking to him. So anyway, the girl finally shows up. So she, now she's a member of the, she comes to the reunions all the time. She's 50 something, I don't know. But that was, that was really sad. And uh, uh, her father just, anyway. But the, but the even more, uh, the, the other incident is uh, similar, but I, in a lot of ways worse. So there was this, a, sec a first lieutenant and he was uh, he was a uh, because they didn't always have captains he was a company commander for um, one of the companies I can't remember which one B company I'll just say that in the second battalion anyway he's he the 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 general rule was you if you're an officer and you're in the, you're you're in the field you're in the field for uh, six months there's a year, t a year total, and then we'll put you in in the headquarters, or back. You know, you just stay crew chief for the second six months. It, it may be back and forth, but uh, you may go go in headquarters first and then go to the field. But it doesn't matter. He he had put his six months in the field, and did a great job. Everybody liked him. He's a young guy, uh, and his name was. Um, Gary Jones, good old American name. And uh, so Gary was all set up to go to the field. I mean, to come in, he, he had done his time in the field and uh, he was still alive, everything's fine. And it turns out he had a, he, he, he was, uh, he, he, he got to know one of the nurses at the Coochie Hospital and, uh, and, uh, they were they were engaged to be married. So, anyway, uh, I'm in the motor pool one day, r right at this time, and there were a couple of lieutenants around. I'm a first lieutenant, 
there was a second lieutenant, but we're all, and as you might imagine, you know, the lieutenants, you know, they get together just like the sergeants get together and they BS and have a good old time and, uh, you know, just killing time. And so while we're there, this, this uh, uh, Gary's replacement is with us. And I think he was a first lieutenant also. May have been a captain. But anyway, we're horsing around, and finally uh, somebody has a Jeep. And so, so, so they say, okay, we'll see you later. And the, the Jeep drives off, and, and when it drives off, it runs over this guy's foot. That's the, uh, that is the replacement for Gary Jones. It runs over his foot. And he's hopping around, and of course we're laughing and, you know, and thinking how, how funny it is, but it broke his foot. So anyway, the, the, the battalion commander calls uh, Jones in and says, well, you gotta go back out. Uh, we'll get, we'll get a, there'll be another guy coming in next week. He says, but we're going out, we're, you gotta go back out. So we go out and, and we get into one of the bigger fights we've ever been in. I mean, it was, in fact, I think it was that day I, 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 I shot 4,500 rounds. They, they, we got caught out in the open. It was a dry season. Anyway, so, uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm the liaison. I'm a captain now. I'm the liaison for the battalion. So I'm shooting all the artillery from a helicopter, from a chopper. And one of the things my job required me to do was I had to have a radio that, that was set on a frequency for the artillery. Obviously, that's my main job. But I had another radio uh, that uh, just with an earphone. So I had two radios, but I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a chopper. I just set them on the floor. And, and so I got the other one in, this, in, in my ear. And I, have, I had this, the guy before me found this, uh, there's like a pilot's helmet, you know, a real helmet, so I could plug it into that thing. So in this ear, in this ear, I'm listening to, in my left ear, I'm listening to what the battalion commander is saying to the company commanders and the platoon leaders. And in my right ear, I'm talking to the artillery saying, right five zero, add 100, battery six, or something like that. And uh, so uh, immediately on when this firefight starts, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I call a fire mission. I, I'm, I'm cranking this thing up as quick as I can. And, uh, and in, in, my, in the infantry on this side, I hear uh, uh, six, this is, uh, this is Delta, Delta six or whatever. It's, it's, it's Jones' uh, uh, RTO, the guy that carries uh, Gary Jones is ready. He says, six is hit. And I went, oh shit. And so, uh, so uh, the, the 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 colonel says, "Well, we'll get it. We'll get a." We'll, he says, immediately says, just, "Just hold hold still. We'll get a we'll get a, a dust off immediately." Just and then and there's a pause, and then he says, "It's too late," just like that. Mm. Mm. And uh, and I thought to myself. He, didn't, he wasn't even supposed to be here. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, then, then I, 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 so that night, we go back into base camp and, uh, and I'm talking, to, I, 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 you know, everybody knows what happened. So, so I go to this guy uh, that was there and he says, yeah, he says, he, he said, uh, the bullet went in right here and it came out right over here through his helmet and the bullet was lodged here uh, in the helmet. And I, I said, oh, that's terrible. And then, so, so uh, you know, and so uh, I, I'll say something about medals now. You know, they gave him a DSC. That's a Distinguished Service Cross. That's right but right under the uh, Medal of Honor. Now, obviously he got it, uh, 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 what they, uh, posthumously. posthumously, he got it posthumously. But I said, you know, I don't, I don't care. That's, that's fine, that's for his family, that's for his, his, his loved ones, you know. And you know what, 
he he is he, he deserves it just because he he went back out he he wasn't supposed to be out there yeah. so so I'm gonna fast forward to to uh, one of the reunions 50 years later or so I'm, I'm talking to somebody some guy I never never knew and he says and he's got his wife with him and he says oh yeah I knew him he was my company he was my company commander. He, he, and Marsha and I were both there, and 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 uh, he says, uh, and then his wife starts because she's she says, well, his the girl he was supposed to marry came to the reunions, was coming to the reunions before that, and uh, and she said, she when they got when they took him back, when they took Jones back to Coochie to the hospital. He was still alive. He actually, I don't know how he was, but they took him into the OR, and they said his, uh, I forget his, what, what his girlfriend, what his fiance's name was, but anyway, she came in, she just, she, she came into the, to the, to the, where they had him, and uh, looked in the door, looked at him, never said anything, then turned and walked away, and he was dead the next morning. So, and they said that she came to reunions, she, and she never got married, and, uh, and then she died of a stroke a couple of years before. That, that, that was just, that was one of those stories, you know, I mean, people like to tell, well, you know. Uh, wrong place at the wrong time. Wrong place, and it just shows you that, you know, it's not, it, it it's, I mean, you could be in the thick of a, of some kind of a firefight, and obviously, the guys like to talk about being in a big firefight. But you know, there's other things going on that are, that are more. That get you more than than just. Well, anyway, how, how was the weather over there generally? It was pretty hot. It was it was hot, but uh, I hate to hear it say this, but it was a dry heat. Uh huh. So. And uh, uh, what that meant was that, uh, and we had we had these jungle fatigues, which meant, you know, we were in and out of the water all the time. And uh, and but as soon as you got out, you just if you if you if you really wanted to be comfortable a little bit, you take your boots off, and your socks are wool. You squeeze them out, and then they're fine. Uh, and uh, and you're and before you know it, your uniform. Nobody wears underwear. Your uniform's dry and everything's fine. In fact, you just you just got your uniform laundered. You know, after you've been through a canal <laughs> or a, so. And I remember another time. I remember the commanding general came came down. We were in a rice paddy, and uh, 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 the commanding general, uh, division commander, uh, who. Uh, uh, that something went on, uh, and and anyway, he he was interested. So he so he lands, and he and and his aide, who was a captain, uh, all come at, get get out of the chopper, and they're all in their starch fatigues and everything, and they're standing on the the dike, and uh, me and uh, my my radio operator, we're sitting in the in the rice paddy, up to our waist in water, just sitting there smoking a cigarette, and he 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 comes up. <laughs> And we didn't move a muscle. We just, I mean, nobody's going to jump up and salute him or anything. There's none of that going on. But it, it, it struck me that this is really strange. You know, here we are. I'm, I'm sit. I hate to be wet. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, when I, when, all the years I skied, the worst thing that could happen to me was, you know, get your, be, have, uh, sit on a, 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 a chairlift and get your, and, and melt the ice that was in there or snow and you're, your butt's all wet, you know. But here I'm sitting in the water smoking a cigarette, you know. And, and uh, so, but well, the, just to finish it, you know. The, so they're standing on the dike and talking and pointing and all this. And and all of a sudden the uh, the general, he's two-star, jumps into the water to look at something. The captain jumped in right behind him. And I thought, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> You <laughs> can't, can't let the general get all wet and him not be wet, so. Is that Lance's stepfather? Oh, that's right. It turns out that was uh, 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 
Marcia's my my lovely wife that was her best friend or one of her good friend good friends uh, that that journal was her stepfather and the way, reason uh, we found out about it is uh, for that September 4th because I was in command they gave me a bronze star I mean it's not worth anything you know they gave me a bronze star okay so it was on the wall and uh, Landis that was uh, Marsha's friend comes in and she l was looking at the it was him giving it to you no, it's, it's on the... It was in the wall. It was a picture on the wall of him giving you the medal. Oh, okay. She saw the picture. <coughs> yeah, she said, that's my, that's my stepfather. <laughs> so, small, small world. world. Small world, right. world, yeah. That was... Well, did, uh, did you ever go out on any uh, reconnaissance where you're walking and you come across any VC uh, uh, mines or trip wires or anything like that? Uh, you know... Uh, that it, it was that first six weeks that, that I had the opportunity to do stuff like that. But uh, all, all I can remember about that is we went into villages, mostly deserted. Although we went into some that were occupied, and and basically they they treated they just ignored us. And uh, if, if we thought something, now, now uh, the the infantrymen, you know, they're kids basically, right? Yeah. So and they got hand grenades and they got all this. The, all of the explosives. So if they saw a hole, they they would they they would want to blow up, throw a charge in there in case you know, somebody somebody was hiding in there. So other than that, though, I, we never came across. There was not any heavy weaponry in the South. Wow. Uh, like uh, like, I never came across what what what, what amount of what it would uh, be comparable to a 50 caliber machine gun. You know, they, they just didn't have them. They had them up north, and uh, and they had plenty of AK-47s, and uh, they were all full automatic. So, I mean, they're. Well, we spent a lot of time on the on your uh, tenure there in, in Vietnam, which has been super interesting. But let's get you out of Vietnam. How did? Where did you fly home? Did you fly home or sail home? I flew. I flew into, uh, I guess, Oakland. And then I went, or... Was that commercial or was that... Commercial. No. Flu commercial. Let's see. And that, that's a, that's a, there's an interesting, uh, uh, I, I heard, I saw somebody write about it one time. So as soon as you get off, you know, these, all these flights into Vietnam are, com are commercial charters. So the, so, so you fly in and the whole plane goes walking towards the terminal and and on the other side you see this a, a, a similar number come walking to get on the plane and you say they're leaving we're just getting here they're leaving will we be here for that part and then and then of course a year later the same thing happens you're on that you're that that uh that crew that's getting on the plane, gonna eat all that filet mignon and all that stuff they're gonna give you. And those those poor guys, you know, they're they're just starting. So is that what you had to eat on the way home? Yeah, they were they were very good to us. I mean, they they would. I remember this. Uh, it was a TWA, you know. We 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 they fed us good, and then they, she came around later. And, would you like another filet? <laughs> and you know, young boys, young men, they. They eat a lot, so yeah, they were very good to us. So you you came back to where? Uh, I, I'm pretty Oakland. sure of Oakland, and then. Uh, Are you uh, in uniform or, or civilian? I was in I was in uniform, and uh, it was th that was the first time I realized that there was all this talk about uh, uh, baby killers. You know, we were baby killers, and then there was the other the other thing about. Uh, 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 people getting spit on. I bet you that probably happened once or twice, not very often. Because I just couldn't imagine anybody coming up to me and uh, and doing something like that. Because I'd, I'd beat the shit out of them. <laughs> and, that, and I was capable back then, and I knew how to, how to anyway, I, anyway, but there was all this, this bad press, I, bad meaning. They talked about things not welcoming the 
the, the troops home or anything like they do now. And uh, so, how were you greeted? Okay. Yeah, I was. You know, nobody. Uh, uh, there was no uh, nothing uh, on the plane back, and then I got on a commercial uh, airliner there and to come back to Dulles, and uh, and I was in uniform and nothing. The uh, was nothing went on. There was no. It was, and then, and then once we got, once I got here, it was. We don't want to talk about. It. We don't talk about any of this now. There was a few guys that said, "Oh, you, you were in the war." Yeah, and um, but people weren't talking about it. So you come back home, and, and we've talked a number of times here uh, about your wife. Uh, What's your wife's full name? He had another. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, when I came back, uh, listen, it's, you know, I, I live the American dream. Part of the American dream is you got to have an ex-wife, right? <laughs> so, so, so when I got home, uh, I was just, I was having a good old time and, and actually in the arm in the military community you know there are plenty of i was stationed at fort meade which was uh headquarters and you know those people uh uh they, they you know there's a lot of uh there's a lot of uh wax there women's army corps and uh the, and civilians and so it was there were a lot of people that were nice to us people <laughs> like me and uh anyway First, talk about your um, jotting hand with the survivors. Oh yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was. A, so so b before I got out, I'm, I'm at Fort Meade headquarters. So basically, just marking time, waiting until I get. They, they, I had a two-year uh, enlistment. Or it wasn't an enlistment. That's not the way to treat officers. But anyway, I was going to get out at the end of January or something like that. It'd be two years. Anyway, so they put me on this as a survivor's assistance officer. And what that means is that I was the, I was, they, they had a, they had, they had uh, uh, a dead soldier come home and uh, his, his family was, uh, they, they gave the body to his family and, uh, and then the family arranged for the funeral and usually uh, it was in a national cemetery. I mean, they had that. Uh, uh, and so uh, the, uh, I was not, they always used a chaplain to, uh, to uh, notify people. So if you're, a lot of these, they were notifying mothers, not wives. They were, because these are young kids. So, so it would be some mother. And uh, so the chaplain, would be sent to to, notif to notify her to give her the bad news, and then I would come along and say anything I can do to help. So anyway, I find out uh, uh, this woman is uh, uh, this mother has talked to a funeral director, and they wanted some some. Uh, what well, even for me, I could realize this is just too much. It was like, I think they, he had a, a $10,000 policy. I think he was one of these that didn't get cheated out of it. But, and, uh, but they were quoting her figures like 3500 4000 for a funeral back in 1968. So I said, well, and, and they told me, he said, now you, you're not supposed to, you don't get involved with the, with the, with it with any of that you 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 can advise her if she asks you a question go ahead i said this is crazy so i i i got on the phone and i started calling funeral homes and i found a one that would do it for eight hundred dollars or something like that and i said that's a casket maybe the army provided the casket you know blah 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 so on and so forth so i told her talk to this i said you take care of this lady blah blah and so uh, I think I was outside the regulation, but I felt good about it. I thought, this woman's lost her son. You know, why are you trying to take her money? Why are you screwing over her? So, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, and I only did that once, but I went to the funeral 
and uh, uh, it was uh, it was very somber and uh, and he, he was a white boy. He wasn't a he wasn't a we call blacks back then, but and uh, and uh, it was down in the uh, uh, in the country, sort of. Let me see from uh, from. Uh, uh, sort of Annapolis, uh, Anne Arundel County, I think it was, you know, but in the suburbs or in the in the rural part of it. So it was in the country. There was a country church, and you know they had the, everything went. And I, I went and paid my. I'm not sure if I was supposed to, but I thought I should, so I went, and uh, it was all and it was all good. And then I I, I went back and. That was the end of that. Then, then I just like I say, I I, I mark time for the, for the, uh, till till my date came up, and then I uh, partied a lot too. They got a lot, they got invited to a lot of parties, <laughs> but you know that's. So uh, then uh, I I did, I, then I went to a, uh, a reunion, a high school reunion, but so that this is. That was '68, so so, so I'd been out of high school ten, ten, 10 years. So it was a ten year. So I run into this girl that I knew in high school, and anyway, it's it's we get married, and we we have my daughter uh, Laura, who's a who's a wonderful daughter, and uh, and uh, it's 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 all part of the. The path you must take to get where you're going. That's the way I always looked at it, you know. But it it ended in divorce. What and kind of work are you doing at that time? I went back to work for uh, Pepco. Pepco, and then I went and get, flipped over and got a job with the D.C. government, doing basically the same kind of thing as an engineer. You also got Colin and Lynn out of the field. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I got I, so I got Laura out of the marriage, and I got Lynn and Colin, who are my two my stepchildren, who treat I treat like they're they're you know the regular like my own kids. They I treat them just like they're my own, and they are they are just like my own. So now we we have a, a nice lady that's kind of helping you with some of these memories. What's her name? <laughs> well, that is my lovely wife, Marcia. Uh, that's who we've talked about a couple of times. Now. Yeah, Marcia came what, along. What's uh, her, uh, what, what was her maiden name? Uh, Mascarello. <clears throat> M-A-S-C-A-R-E-L-L-O? That's correct. All right. And how did you meet Marcia? Well, a friend of mine at work uh, uh, knew about, uh, he, he had a girlfriend, I think, at the time. Who was uh, uh, who had found this? They called it the Circle and Avenue Club. It was professional women, single women that were uh, that that uh, held cocktail parties and then invited single men and single women, and so that people could. Isn't that right? That's, That's what. Right. And so I I went there and uh, and I met Marcia and I thought, well, she she looks pretty good, but probably too good for me, so. I'm wasting my time if I go after her. So I hung around with some other girl for the rest of the night. <laughs> Big mistake. And then? And then, then, uh, then she, uh, she had the good uh, sense to tell my friend or, uh, that uh, I should call her. Good. And, and it did. went from there. And it went from there. And, three, and then we have three wonderful little children. And That's what I was going to get to, oh. to next. Uh, after, after you and Marsha married, did she continue to work? Oh, oh yeah. Marsha had Marsha had. A, she was a very uh, high-powered. She was a vice. Uh, no, she was a she was a center director, and then she got to be a vice president in CS Computer Science Corporation. So she was. She had to work. You know, I I, I couldn't make it on my own. Okay. So you had three children, and uh, the first one you had was Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And how old is Elizabeth? Elizabeth is thirty. Liz, Liz is thirty-five. I've 36. got thirty-seven on this. Thirty-seven. 
That's what it is. I put that. <laughs> and I asked when I when I wrote that. And where's Elizabeth live? She lives in Gaithersburg, and uh, that's about that's that's an hour, a little over an hour and a half. So she comes up and visits me all the time. She, she married? She's married. She's got two kids. One is. Um, um, uh, four and one is two. One is four and one is two. JD is four and L uh, Della is two. What's her married name? Uh, she be, she kept her name, so her she's. Her name is Flack. Her yeah her her husband's name is Flack, but and so uh, the kids have Flack, but but she because uh, she works for Booz Allen. Booz Allen she uh, thought it'd be better to keep her own name for. What, what, what's Booz Allen? Booz Allen is a big uh, accounting firm, accounting consulting. And consulting firm. Yeah. Okay. Big consulting well, I firm. For IBM. Then, she's after Elizabeth, then you had Danielle. Then we had Danielle. Yeah. And she's thirty-six. She's thirty-six now. To be fair, Dan Danielle, uh, after she got out of college, she graduated from college. Then she. Uh, uh, decided that she was going to live in Africa, somewhere along the line like that, and changed her name. So, but I don't call. She met a guy. And yeah. They went to Africa and they had some kind of tribal marriage, and she changed her name. And then the cultural differences were too much. Yeah. So that she broke up. But we have three wonderful grandchildren from that. Yeah, we have yes. So but I, I don't. I, but I, I, I gave her the name Danielle. So I, that's what I never call her anything but that. And, uh, and she has three children. She has three children, mm -hmm. and they're um, Kafira, Hafira, and uh, Satapi, and uh, Hiramaki. And does she still live overseas? No, she lives in Mercersburg, right down the road. Okay. And she's. Uh, she broke up. She came and lived with us for three yeah. years. So here we were. He's eighty, and he's chasing toddlers. So she. <laughs> When she came back from overseas, she lived with you for a couple of years. Uh, she, yeah, three years. She lived in that, in our little cottage down there. First, and then we built that. Yeah, yeah. She lived here first. Yeah, that's right. And then we built that, and then uh, it's it, it, for the best. She, she, she had a pretty good commute. Now she lives next to, her, you know, right in the town, little town. She, she could walk to work if she wanted. Where, where does she work? She works for Mercersburg Academy. She's in uh, the um, register, not registrar. She's in the uh, college counseling. College counseling. The prep, prep school. So all they're interested in their their main focus is getting these rich kids that go there into Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Hopkins and you know all these Michigan. All these prestigious. Yes, schools. exactly. So then your third one is uh, who? Gregory. Gregory James. And Gregory was one of these, I thought I was dreaming. <laughs> anyway, so he came along later because we were, we, were, we were figuring on too. But anyway, it, I don't know what we do without Gregory, but without Greg. And uh, so he's got a wife, Amanda, and he's got two boys, uh, 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 Gus. By Benjamin and and Gustav, Augustus, Augustus, Gus and Reuben, Reuben, four, okay. four and two. And Greg is thirty four. Thirty four. What's right. he do? He is a salesman and he works for Salesforce. Salesforce, which is a big. Uh, they're, they're one of these big. Uh, they're not. They're not a. They're not like Amazon or Google. They sell software to business. Yeah. Yeah, they're a very big company. So they're all, all five of them have really good jobs. Laura is a, a pharmaceutical so, 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 so Mary, are you picking up what uh, Marcia has to say? Yes. Okay. Um, so you worked for the District of Columbia, Department of Highways and Traffic, Electrical Engineer. Uh, then you worked for uh, Department of Public Works in the Budget and Financial Administration. Right. I was the budget officer for the Department of Public Works, which is uh, is uh, it, at that time, even then back then, it was it was uh, a three or four hundred thousand dollar budget we had. 
which is pretty big back then. So where'd you retire from? From there, I retired from the from the D.C. government. How, how long ago did you retire? Uh, long time ago, it was 1993, I think. But anyway, they were they, they were in. Uh, it was during the days uh, you probably heard about it. Oh, Marion Barry and the dope and smoking the pi uh, the pipe and when they caught him and and then they had a couple of uh, people come after him that were just totally uh, inept and they they had hired too many too many of their friends and so they were given early outs left and right and finally I took one and I was only 52 Three, yeah, something like that, and that's why <coughs> that's why Marsha has to work. So, given given that date, the mayor reminded me in a break that I may have said that this was November the fifteenth of nineteen twenty-two, and that would be hard to do. So it's it's two thousand and twenty-two. Two thousand and twenty-two. Uh, so I get yeah. so excited about interviewing you guys that sometimes my tongue gets caught behind my eye tooth. Um. So what, what what do you do in your in your free time? Well, uh, I, I I try to take care of this place here, and to do to do that uh, I have uh, it's a, it's a I'm not a farmer even though this is a farm and it could be a it could be a working farm it, you know I could uh, my neighbor works he, he's a, he's a he's a real farmer he he has uh, beef cattle and uh, and he. Uh, the, the things he grows over there, he feeds them. Anyway, uh, but right, all, all I'm interested in is keeping the fields so they don't get uh, uh, overgrown. Uh, I want them cut every year. We get them cut twice a year. Otherwise, they, they trees start growing and crap starts growing in them and then, then they're no good. So I have, a, I have uh, two tractors. I have a, I have a Kubota, which is primarily a, a, has a backhoe and a front end loader on it. And uh, I always tell everybody, you know, that boys are, boys are born to dig in the dirt. And they, when they're little, they dig in the dirt with their shovels and their fingers and their hands. And when, they're get, when they get older, they get, they get machines. Mm -hmm. So I said, just like I said, you know, it, it's the American dream. You got to have an ex-wife. If you, you got the other one of the other things that I always put on that list is you got to have owned a Corvette. So I, 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 I checked that box a few years ago, and I got through that without getting a speeding ticket, which was unbelievable. Anyway, and then the other thing was to get a backhoe. I always, I always, I've, I've owned a backhoe since I was in my 40s. I, I'm sure, just to dig. Anyway, it comes in, it does everything good, and then I have another tractor that uh, uh, basically is, uh, has a big grapple on it so I can move stuff. And, and so any kind of dead trees that fall, you know, I can get them out of the way, cut them up. I use a certain amount for the fireplace. And uh, uh, what do you mow with? I, you know, I, I, you're, I hope you're gonna like this, but uh, uh, I have a I have a bush hog which I can mow uh, heavy heavy stuff you know uh, brush and things like that and and I use it for that but the there I have a guy that uh, that mows my grass for me now I can get a zero turn mower and everything like that but I figure I like this guy he's been doing it when I didn't when you know and he's got to eat too so I think figure. I don't want to take his job away just because I can do it. That's just the grass around here. Yeah, just around the house. The right. The farmer. right. The farmer takes care of all the other. But Big but thing. but I have a guy that comes and mows the grass and takes care of that. And then we have somebody that, uh, Marsha has somebody that comes and uh, takes care of the planting the things. I, after they're planted, I try to take care of them myself. And then... Uh, We've cut all, I wish I could sh show you some of this, this is a terrible day, but I've gotten trails cut, it's 100 acres, there are trails cut all through it. So you can really go and see the whole thing sitting in a side-by-side, -side, which is a four-wheel drive. Um, so what model of that do you have? I have a mule, which is... Um, Kawasaki. Huh? Kawasaki. 
It's a Kawasaki Mule, and it's uh, basically I got that because it, it runs on diesel. And one of the things is, uh, if you're a farmer and you have tractors and things, you they're all diesel, and you you need to buy off-road diesel and not pay the road use taxes. You probably are familiar with that. You don't if you're if you've got uh, you could buy that. Now you can't put it in your car, your your diesel truck. Big fine if they catch you. <laughs> but oh, you know about that. Good. Anyway, uh, so so I decided because I ha also have a Polaris Ranger, smaller one, which I let the kids use, and that is runs on gasoline. But it just means I gotta now I don't have to fool around with. Why don't you have to fool around? Storing. Yeah, I put a I put a diesel tank in. So now I buy diesel. Uh, by bulk. By bulk, a 270 gallon tank, and it'll it'll last. I have to fill it up maybe once, maybe twice a year, but once and a half like that. And then uh, my newest thing I'm going to get is a portable sawmill because uh, on a place like this with all these trees, when they die, they if there's they're more the the the, the predominance in the, is oak. So every time an oak tree falls, I, I can cut it, cut it down in, into up to 20 foot long, which I, I'm not going to do that unless I got something very special. But this sawmill is on wheels, so I can take it around anywhere I want. I, I haven't got it yet. I, it's on order, but uh, but I'll I'll get it next year, and then uh, then I'll be able to. And I got some people that help me because that's something that's something I I won't do by myself. But uh, cut it into slabs and then what? It'll, it'll cut it into boards and then. But the first thing I think about is that property out front uh, has a derelict house which we're going to burn in the next couple of weeks, I hope, and get rid of it. And then, and then I'm th hoping my daughter moves up, and then uh, I might build a barn down there. Uh, not where that old barn was, but somewhere down there, and then I'll, but I'll I'll use if if I can use green wood, which means I don't have to have it uh, seasoned mm -hmm. first. Uh, it, it, to build it in a house like this, you you can't just cut trees down. You know, that has to be it has to be uh, got to be kiln dried. Kiln dried. dried. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, but for a barn, you don't have to. So that's what I'll. That's my goal for that, and then. Um, I have a big snow plow because you saw my driveway, uh, and when we the first I think the first year or second year we were here we got two feet of snow and wow. four <laughs> four feet of snow, it really was. and it was so deep that you know I, I have a I have a uh, all wheel uh, four wheel drive uh, you know Tundra which is a big truck big pickup, but as soon as the snow gets deep enough you you know you lose it. it pushes you up and you can't go anywhere. But this snow plow will fit on either tractor and uh, it's, you know, it moves left and right so I can push the snow out of the way and uh, uh, live happily ever after. I, I'm, I'm living <laughs> happily ever after, that's right. I, it, it's, uh, you know, I, and the, the, the beauty is that, that <clears throat> we were, I, uh, I, I was lucky enough to uh, that, that Marsha and I are both th have the same frugality or very close to you know we don't waste money and I'm talking about from the time we met till we retired now that we're now we're very free with the money if we've got it we spend it right and if it's something we want or if it's something for the kids we we've, we've we we've we've done like for instance my uh, yeah it's fine my daughter, that we we started this where where my we said if you buy a house to the kids, you buy a house, we'll help you fix it up to this following limit. Mm -hmm. So so uh, Liz bought a house, we we so we paid to put in hardwood floors all through the house, mm -hmm. and and remodel the kitchen. That's that's not nothing, right? And but that's now she's happy as a, you know and what. And uh, then the second one, and, and not only that, we uh, we uh, we we worked a deal where if we want to come to Bethesda 
and stay, then you, that she has this very nice suite on the first. Yeah. And we, we, we're now, but we're not the type that we, you know. You don't we, take advantage. Don't, of don't take advantage of because we, yeah. So, but but it's there, and she knows it, and we have first dibs on it, and she can't give it to her other in law. Uh, <clears throat> forget about that. That's right. This a lot of people even listen to this side. Anyway, and then the next one, Laura. Uh, Laura came along and wanted to, she's a beach person, so she bought a place in Ocean Pines, Ocean City, you know. So we go up there and we helped her fix that place up. And then, uh, and then Greg, right? Right. Greg, Greg huh? Danny bought a place. Oh, and then Danny bought a place. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah. she bought a house in Mercersburg. We helped her fix that up. I mean, that was... You have to buy a house you can afford, and then we renovate. Yeah, and then finally Greg bought a house. He lived in D.C. in a third floor walk-up. We we never went to visit him, but he said, "So you moved." And but so now he lives in a regular subdivision house. Wouldn't you call it that? Yeah. So we we put in some hardwood floors in there. Yeah, he got at least we put a garage and some. Yeah, yeah, we he had a garage. Yeah, he had a carport. So, you know, we're, if we got it, we, we're, we're not, a, we'll, we'll spend it. We're not, we're not saving for the future. Well, you're, uh, you're, you're one of those guys that you can always tell the, whether a fellow is success by the number and size of his toys. Yeah, if, if you look at my toys, I'm a success. <laughs> All right, got two uh, tractors. We've been at this a good long time. Mary, before we get to Marcia, do you have anything you want to uh, ask him about? I can't think of anything offhand. What? 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 Your, what? Did your friends call you? Did, did they always call you uh, by your full name, or did you have a nickname? Well, they. Uh, when I was in high school, it was Kim. It was all Kim. Kim. Yeah, Kim, my last name, and that was pretty much. The, everybody did that. Then when we got older, you know. My friends and even the friends that I and people I knew, it all went back to Derwin. And uh, uh, while I was in, when I was in college, it was uh, uh, A D, they just D, just, just, or, and then some of them Big D, hey Big D, uh -huh. and uh, so it's it hasn't hasn't been one thing all the whole time, but it's, you know, and I've I've uh, I shut. The high school. Think about it. You never told me you were a college football star. Yeah, well, I was going to ask about that. We talked about high school uh, and playing all these sports. Uh, how did your teams do in uh, basketball, football, and track? Oh, in high school, we were awful. Uh, track, track. I was a state high jump champ. I won't tell you how high I jumped, but uh, my senior year, I was a state. Actually, I tied for it, but oh, I'd be interested in knowing how high you went because I used to high jump. Oh, it was not very high. I think I was six nine or something like. That. I mean five nine. What am I saying? Six nine. Oh, okay. But it was it was scissors. It was not like they do now. The flop. I, that's what I did. The scissors. I couldn't learn the western roll, and I and they oh. didn't have the flop back then. So I was about the same. Oh, I did. Same maybe I did the yeah. Something like that. But I, I like to run the hurdles, and I like to. I used to like to run a leg of the, of really? the mile relay, but uh, it was not. Uh, um, I was not that good. I, I was fast enough, but not. I didn't have blazing speed, although uh, I, I was. I was plenty okay. How about you know, football? Well, I played football in only one year in uh, in uh, high school. How about basketball? And I played basketball, and uh, we, we weren't very good in basketball either. We did, the, it was m mostly the coaching, but we well, did you play good. in college? Yeah, I played football in college, but that's interesting because because uh, I went to Hopkins, and Hopkins was prim their primary sport. Uh, you may know this was lacrosse. Lacrosse. Mm -hmm. For instance, they're one of the they're the only s Division three school. I think they're Division Three. That plays all Division Three sports except lacrosse, which they play Division One. 
Oh, you knew that. Good for you. Anyway, so when I got there, you know, there were a lot of cross players that played football. And basically, uh, the uh, 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 I was sort of lost in the shuffle. I wanted to be a fullback, and I, and I, I should have been... I should have been a wide receiver, which is what I eventually became. But anyway, as a consequence, I played almost no freshman football. I was on the team, but almost played none. And then when I was a sophomore, uh, they had a guy. They, they I switched to. Uh, uh, they switched me over to a, a to a receiver, but but there was a guy, a uh, senior that was entrenched in the spot. And he couldn't catch a pass, though. But in, in any case, so basically I played almost none, n not at all. And this is back when they, you, you could only play varsity from your sophomore year. Right. So so I, as a sophomore, I, I bet you I didn't play six downs the whole damn whole year. So my junior year, the, uh, the, um, uh, was the first time and the, I got I, I was on the team again, and they started me. I started the opening the opening play. They threw a pass to me. I caught it, and they ran for 20, 30 yards. Didn't get a touchdown or anything, and uh, had a great season. And we won uh, a championship. We won the Middle Atlantic uh, uh, Division Three, and uh, uh, I was all conference, and. Uh, and had a great year, and then my senior year, uh, we had uh, we, we we had some pretty good players that we lost uh, from graduation. But we still had a pretty good team, and we won a few games. But we we had one we had that's when I had my my best game ever. We went to a, a small school called Hampton Sydney, which is a small school. At that time, it was all boys. I don't know what it is now. It's probably not all boys, but who knows? It's down there in in, in Virginia, and uh, they they had uh, um, they had really good foot uh, uh, sports teams. They had uh, uh, people in the, in track and field. They had good basketball. But they had great football teams. So I, the first year I was at uh, at Hopkins, they came to they came up to play us and just annihilated our team. I mean, they had this little this all all American little they call it little all American, but he he was uh, Billy Benson. He was just a, a phenom. Anyway, so the next year I don't think we played them. So so by at my senior year, we go we go to play. Uh, we're not doing as well, but we're, we're okay. And uh, so uh, we're going to play Hampton Sydney, and I, I kept the program, so I, I know I'm not making this up. On their homecoming, now down there in in uh, black in black, it wasn't Blacksburg though. It was some whatever it was, whatever the town is. So we go down there to play them on their homecoming. Well, anybody that knows anything knows. When you're playing your home, when you got your homecoming, you bring in a patsy that you can beat up on, right? <laughs> and so we, at the time, I, I wasn't, I didn't realize it. So we go in there, and they're, they're, they're just as sharp looking as, as they ever was, that I ever seen them. And uh, so anyway, uh, the long and the short of it is, they, they throw me a pass. And I run for a touchdown, you know, like a 40, 50 yard pass. It wasn't a, it wasn't a dink over, you know, down on a two yard line. You know, I caught the ball and ran, outran the secondary. And so we're up anyway, that happened and we missed the extra point. So then they, then the game goes on and then, and the, uh, they, I catch another pass, another long pass. 30, 40, 50 yards, I don't remember. And outrun the secondary. So now we're up 12 because we missed the extra point. But anyway, <laughs> the score, they, 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 they 
finally got a touchdown and went for two. They got so they got eight points, right? And uh, and so the uh, I mean, we're playing with our second string quarterback. So the the guy that's the first string quarterback, you know, he wants to be part of this. He had been had a slight injury, so he comes in. I, I like the guys. He t he he was later on the uh, became he was a lacrosse player. He came in to the game. And uh, and later on, in, in, in after we were all out of school, you know, he became the coach of Hopkins, and they won a couple of national championships. That's how good the guy was. He so uh, uh, that was uh, Henry Chicaroni. Anyway, so uh, so then he he talks to coach, and, and so we're ahead twelve to eight, and and he comes he talks the coach into play, and he comes in. Throws me another touchdown, long touchdown pass, and uh, you know it was you know at the time I'm of course having I'm having fun you know first of all I, I, I'm I'm the whole damn I'm, a whole, I'm scoring everything right and so did you make an extra point on that third no we didn't. so we went end up winning <laughs> eighteen to eight and on the bus ride home at night you know they had the radio on and it said. And in local football, you know, uh, Derwin Kim scored three touchdowns. <laughs> and as Hopkins of Kim, uh, Hampton Sydney. And uh, anyway, anyway, so it was, but what was funny about it was, I, I, and I, I, it could be the fall, but usually you would remember something like this. Nobody came up to me. There was one guy, one player that really made a lot about it, came up and talked to me about it. None of the coaches came up and said anything. None of them. <laughs> and I and I and I didn't I didn't really notice it at the time, but late, years later I thought they should have said something. Yeah. They should have said a great game, game or what? Great, yeah, something. <laughs> anyway, it turns out though, but but I had a great year, and I look in their yearbook and I find out that in our conference, you know, I was the leading scorer in the conference, and uh, and. Uh, the uh, and I was all conference and an honorable mention for a little all American, and you know you know how many pictures were in the football section of me. Okay. One. <laughs> <laughs> Playing defense. Oh gee. <laughs> yeah. I was in the team picture, of course, but yeah. one picture, and I thought. It's, what's the matter with these people? That was the whole they damn team. They didn't appreciate it. They didn't appreciate well, Marcia, it. Marcia, do you have anything that you want to bring out? That you know, I I don't know if there's anything I want to ask him I about. We. Him an awful lot. He was, I was at the beginning. He, his uh, they were very they were very poor. <laughs> his father and uh, but all three of the kids, his brother, Derwin, his brother and sister, all went to college and. Ended up quite prosperous. They, uh, his father came from Korea, was a left Harvard, touched up photos, and when that industry left, he was only about fifty or so, and Derwin would have been like about ten. Ten. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> his mother was a third grade teacher, and was that was the only support they had. So it makes makes it things was, uh, makes things tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, was, that was my question. Did you go to college on a football scholarship? No, but I did get an academic scholarship. Academic. And, okay. and well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it to the full <laughs> disclosure. There, uh, Hopkins obviously is one of these hoity-toities, you know. Mm -hmm. And and so they, ha but they had a guy, and his name was Newton H. White, and uh, he was a naval captain. And he got, I don't know what kind of, where he got his money, whether he got it for his wife or what. And I've asked, up at, you know, when I've gone back, mm -hmm. nobody knows. But anyway, he built a field house and with a swimming pool and everything. And that was this guy was loaded. So, but he, he lived over here uh, in, in PG County. So he set up, uh, as part of, his, the, of, of all the money he set up, he said, "I want uh, I want one scholarship for a a boy in PG County to go to Hopkins, and I got it. 
wonderful. Yeah, I know. Otherwise, I couldn't have gone. How did, how did Boris go? Bo Boris was my brother. He was a lot smarter than I was. And he, he did much better on the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the... Uh, not the they weren't SATs. The, they were SAT college or, boards and okay. and then and the and the merit scholarship thing. So uh, so he 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 got a he got a scholarship too. He went on a scholarship, but it, which paid for your, my tu his tuition and my tuition. So so I had to I had to cover the uh, um, the board room and board, and so I, that that was that inserting that I used to do at the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And then I, I worked at a gas station, pumping gas. And uh, because back then you, had, you didn't pump your own gas. Right. So I, I did I did that and uh, I greased cars, changed oil, stuff like that, learned Washington, something. Worked at the Washington Monument. Well, oh yeah, I worked at the Washington Monument. What'd you do there? I was, uh, they, they opened the Washington Monument, if you've ever been there, uh, the uh, back in those days, you could walk up or down either way. Now it's all forbidden. You can't. I don't even know what it is now. They, but anyway, they have special tours to get to, to get inside there. So you could walk up and down. And but they opened it up from four to eleven, or something like that. And they hired a bunch of college kids. Mm -hmm. I was one of them. And uh, and I only knew it because I knew a, a lady that worked for Interior Department. That is, that's who runs the place. And she found out about it and told me, to, you know, my, he's a friend, her husband's my friend. Anyway, so I uh, got this job, and so basically we ran the elevator, mm -hmm. and uh, we stood around outside, you know, and answered questions, and then uh, we we were at the questions, you know, we, we all shifted around, and uh, but but we were all college kids, right? So we did. Stupid things, <laughs> and uh, one of the things we did, we had, w we had a recorder in the uh, uh, that that when you got on the elevator, the recording started, and uh, uh, and it would say, "Welcome to the Washington Monument," blah 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 blah, and then it would stop by the time you got to the top. So there was this one, so so everybody, I was a, I think I was a junior. And uh, that's what everybody was, you know. They were, you know, maybe 20 years old, young guys. But there was this one guy who was older. I mean, he may have been 28 or 30, you know. He was somehow going to school. So, so we got this record of Little Richard singing Tutti Frutti. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> Tutti Frutti, all Rudy. Anyway, so we got this record. And we waited until he was on the he was on the elevator, you know, and then and we put it on so that when he when the when the when the Susie started the elevator up, it started playing Tutti Frutti. <laughs> so I, I I talked to him later. I said, well, "What did you do?" He says, "I just hit the button and turned it off." <laughs> I said, "You should let it play." But we did stuff like that. And and then there was this other kid, you know. I mean, when you're young, you know. Young and stupid go together, right? So, so there was uh, uh, there was a guy. Uh, I mean, excuse me. There was a, uh, a pistol for the night for the guy that worked the late shift. They, n nobody, nobody was supposed to mess around with the pistol, but it was in a holster and it was down in the in the office, you know, down below. So uh, there was this one kid, you know, just you know, he was he was. Uh, Stupider than the rest of us, so uh, they they let him uh, the the night guy the the, the 11, 11 to seven guy uh, was going to be off or something. So they asked who would who would do it, and this guy I'll do it. So so this kid, I mean he's a nice kid. I liked him, you know. He's funny. Anyway, he gets in there, and uh, so uh, so we come back. Uh, the next day or next couple of days, and then there's this flap. He says, one of the bullets is missing from the gun. And uh, so I said, so we, me and this other guy, what the hell happened? What, what? He says, well, I was sitting there playing with it, and it went off. 
And I looked, we looked up, and there were, you could see where the lead <laughs> on the ceiling. You know, it's concrete. So I didn't, didn't do anything, just splatted up there. I said, what, well, I forget his name. I said, I said Tom, you're a dumbass. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, but you know, we knew where the, that that was. Nobody ever found out, though. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, that was fun to be that age. Shall I turn this off? You know, we've been at this a long time. Oh, thank it's you been for fun. This Gosh, it's been thank, great. Thank you for your service. Oh, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you for your. I